Welcome to Mage of the Ascension, Alien Avatar, a one-shot fundraiser for Love Your Rebellion. I am Tyler Elucheckos on Twitter, and I am your storyteller for this tale of madness and tragedy. Before we continue, we'd like to remind you that due to mature themes of horror and violence explored in our shows, we encourage listener discretion and the use of safety tools in gaming. We are Vorpal Tales, and we play a wide assortment of games seven days a week, sometimes twice a day. To know more about our many games, be sure to check the calendar on VorpalTales.com. To stay up to date with our shows, there's a link there to join our Discord where you will get notifications of every new show that comes along and every event. You can check out our Twitch at twitch.tv slash Tales and our YouTube at youtube.com slash c slash Tales, which has a backlog of hundreds of games. Very special thanks tonight to Dark Somnia Music, Savic, Travis Savoy, Epidemic Sound, Aim to Head Official, Helmgast, Free League, and myself for providing the songs you will hear the next 13 days of charity events. We'll add more as we get them. Thanks to Roll20 Tabletop for providing an excellent virtual platform for us to run many of our games. And last but not least, a warm thanks to our listeners and fans for both tuning in and helping out with an awesome fundraising event. With me are those seeking to ascend. Mages, let the audience know who you are. Hey everybody, I'm Ambrose. My pronouns are he or they. You can find me all over the internet as Am Changeling because it me, Am Changeling. You can find me on Etsy at Thornkind, and tonight I will be playing Kieran, whose pronouns are also he, they, a Chakravanti mage who may or may not be an assassin. No, definitely an assassin. Hey there, my name's Corey, aka Narf on the interwebs. It's where you can find me on Twitter and the likes. Uh, and uh, I am they, them, and tonight I'll be playing Professor Gray, the Society of Ethers uh, foremost inventor chemist. Uh, he, they. Hi, everyone. I'm Rhett Altman, they, them. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Road River Rail, uh, and if you just can't get enough of hilarious mage jokes. I'll also invite you to follow me on at Tech Union Actual, where I represent the forces of normalcy. Um, but tonight, I will not be representing the forces of normalcy. I will be playing Jealousy, they, them, a new age and occult shop owner from the Hollow Ones. Hi, everybody. I'm Angela, she, her, and I am at LoveYR. Rebellion. I'm the founder of Love Your Rebellion, one of the guests for tonight's fundraiser. Um, and I am playing a um, rock star sensualist who's also an artist. Um, so we're going to have a, an interesting uh, character for me tonight. I'm, I'm excited. Um, and she is also she, her. Hello, everyone. Jason Teeters, he, him. Uh, you can find me, uh, Teeters Jason, on Twitter and Instagram. Um, I will be playing, and I, I'm also a, a board member of Love Your Rebellion, excited to be here first time. Uh, and I will be playing Lagil Tajij Burns, uh, wildlife and uh, survivalist from the backwoods of Tippecanoe, New Indiana, close to Mishawaka. So excited to be here today. Hello, my name is Rachel. I'm Stolen Fires pretty much everywhere on the internet. And today I will be playing Joe, or both she, her. She is a theological anthropologist, which I'm not entirely sure what that means, but let's find out. Excellent. Today kicks off 13 days of one shots in the world of darkness and the many universes of Powered by the Apocalypse. As we begin our second annual Love Your Rebellion fundraising event, last year we raised over $3,400 and we hope to beat that this year. To help us, we have lots of incentives for you. We have eight main charity milestones. Next one being at 500 bucks, Zach will run a one shot for randomly selected winners from our fans, beginning with the uh, donators at all of my tabs closing. I believe Ambrose is next, though, while I look it up real quick. I do? I believe you're the second tier, but I'm double checking. Oh, yeah. I think, yeah, I'm some sort of low tier because Tyler likes to make me suffer. Oh, that's not a lie. Uh, Joke's on you. I'm into that. It's $1,000. No. $1,000 tier is Meredith will 
put you in her servers, either on or off camera, on her own channel, where she plays all kinds of cool, vibing video games. Anyone from our regular audience of fans knows all about that. At fifteen hundred dollars, Rachel will run a one shot for uh, selected fan winners game to be determined by her and you at two thousand dollars ambrose will run a full campaign on vorpal tales as a live play instead of these endless one shots that he only ever does glare uh he hasn't picked a game yet so you got to get us there so we have to make him at twenty five hundred dollars rosie odd duck dice will create you a commission set of dice and or a one shot whichever you want more she's very good at vampire at three thousand dollars you would be able to experience halloween horror nights with me and one of these victims from among our leadership. Once a week, every week, through the entirety of October, we'll either watch horror movies, talk about horror stuff, or play horror one-shots. We'll figure out the scheduling with the winners if we get that far. At $3,500, Warple Tales will do Calvin Ball 2022, because that was a big hit last year. That is where the fans in the Discord will get to pick uh, six games and six characters from those games that I will make into pre-mades, and then I will select six victims from our cast, and we'll put them all with different rules in one story and see how long it takes to fall apart. And at $4,000, we will run a full-length campaign from a blockbuster franchise chosen by you, the fans, from 10 games, if I can find the list. I'll give it to you now. It's a game where you roll dice, right? Yeah, it is. Blockbuster franchises means uh, we've never done them on the show, and they are all big names. So the 10 games will include such things as Stargate, Star Wars, Ghostbusters, Terminator. Something else hilarious I can't remember right now. We'll get you the whole list once I find it again. There are 10 in total, and the audience will get to vote on which ones they want. And that will be a full minimum 30-episode campaign. Uh, we also have individual rewards for each game in Mage, and you can either uh, just put a note when you click the donate link for Tiltify what you want it to be, and our producer will create a post for this that she can throw around. Uh, for $5, you can either choose to boost or unboost the party. This will give them bonus dice from their pool or increase the difficulty to a roll for each of them. At $10, uh, you can provide a major boost or unboost, which will come in the form of Paradox for the penalty, or Quintessence, which lowers magic casting DCs for the bonus. And for $20, I will randomly throw in a brand new enemy for them to have to deal with. Now, I'm going to let everyone else throw down because they may also have special charity milestone events and or rewards that they want to give away. So let's start with Ambrose. Got anything special? I was doing it because you were drinking. Uh, ass. Anyway, um, hmm. Gosh, I don't know, actually. Uh, hmm. <laughs> I, we might as well go in an order of people who have ideas. I, I just like putting you on the spot. Anybody mm -hmm. can speak up if they have something they want to give away for donations. Uh, yeah, as mentioned earlier, I will be running a one-shot. I don't know if it'll be streamed, but I will run it for four randomly selected people uh, who get to decide what game they want to see me run. I'll run anything that's not fatal. I highly suggest you ask for Vampire. <laughs> I mean, I, as long as it's not fatal, I'll run it. I have a few rewards we can share from Love Let's Your Let's do it. Well, um, so at $500, we will offer two issues of our literary arts magazine. Um, at uh, 1000 we'll do two-year subscription to our Patreon, which gets you annual subscriptions to our zine and um, also any other goodies that come along with the highest tier there. Um, what was your next level? I'm sorry, I forgot. I'm bad at it. Every 500 Every 500. So 15. Okay. Um, so at 1500, we will uh, send you a t shirt from our upcoming, send one person a t shirt uh, from our upcoming uh, festival, um, Babe Fest. So we'll pick maybe at random one of the viewers of people who have donated. 
um, and you'll get a t-shirt. Um, and, and then we'll jump to like, let's do like at, at 3000. So we're going to go a little higher <laughs> at 3000. We'll give you a vinyl. Um, which is a, we'll give one person a vinyl, one of the people who donates vinyl, uh, it's a seven inch um, vinyl that's all punk music that is queer, female, or femme fronted um, and um, curated by Love Your Rebellion. It's called Gritty But Pretty. And uh, then um, at the top tier at 4,000, we will do um, two zines, so this is to, to one person who donates two zines, a vinyl, and a shirt from our upcoming Babe Fest. Awesome. Okay. And now, uh, we've been talking about Love Your Rebellion a lot, and I have this big speech here, but I feel like I can have Angela do the speech instead because she's here. So, Angela, why don't you tell everyone about Love Your Rebellion for a minute? Sure, I can do that. Um, so, Love Your Rebellion is a 501c3 with the mission to empower marginalized groups through the arts. And we do that through our three main object objectives, which is employment, exposure, and assistance. Um, so we do that through uh, hiring artists, writers, musicians uh, from marginalized groups um, to play at our music festivals, published in our magazines, uh, highlighted um, in our art shows and um, paid for their work. Um, that's, a, that's a big thing for us is we pay artists and musicians as much as we can for their work um, and exposure through these formats as well. Um, and assistance is that we create experiences or tools in the arts that um, assist other organizations in our community uh, who support marginalized groups in ways that we do not. So for example, our zine that I talked about, that's one of the rewards. It's a biannual, biannual literary and therapeutic arts magazine. Um, we print about a thousand a year and we donate 500 to an organization in Lee County, Florida called Abuse Counseling and Treatment and um, ACT as they're called. Um, they're a nonprofit organization that serves uh, the community survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. And our tool, our literary and therapeutic arts zine, is used in their one on one group counselings and also given out um, to folks who use services at their rape crisis center, which is the only one in Lee County. So, through that, we help about 3,000 people annually. Um, and so that's just one of the examples of one of our programs and how it serves the communities uh, in our mission. So um, that's kind of the long and short of us. If you want to learn more in depth about the programs that we offer, and even some of the digital programs like our zine archive, you can visit us at loveyourrebellion.org. You can follow us at Love Your Rebellion on Instagram and on Twitter would be love yr rebellion um so that is that's lyr in a nutshell that's, that's pretty much what we do awesome and of course i will also say when it comes to uh vorpal tales love your rebellion is very near and dear to our hearts because uh, not only jason but also ambrose is on the board of directors so definitely check them out check their website out Help us out, spread the word, even if you don't want to donate, let people know they exist. Okay. Let's talk about Mage. So, Mage the Ascension is a game in the World of Darkness line, uh, product line of games that began with Vampire the Masquerade way back in 1991, 1992. Uh, it is a game line of uh, storytelling, one of the earliest of its kind. Some of us consider it a little crunchy now, but at the time, it was it was a dice light game compared to most games that existed in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, designed to tell uh, less about killing monsters and more about telling stories. Each game in the line of World of Darkness has a specific theme. Vampires, wraiths, uh, shapeshifters, mages, and Stranger Things. 
and at the very end, hunters who exist to kill all those things and reclaim the world for humanity. Mages are extremely rare, maybe one in every few million people even has a chance of becoming a mage, and of those, not all of them do. You are a person who was born different, born special, and or through a lot of crazy hard work and nonsense, were taught how to change your reality simply by force of will. Uh, it's not necessarily like Harry Potter, but it is. It's not necessarily like The Matrix, but it also is. It's not necessarily uh, like The Dresden Files, but it also is. Because in order to be a mage, the way you change your reality is through your understanding of reality. The way you believe things work is what creates change based on how you make them happen. So in this universe, Harry Dresden could exist next to the Ghostbusters and next to Neo, and they would all do their thing separately, believing in different things and manifesting change in the world through will. At the heart of it, it's a game that both explores if you had the power to change anything, what would you do with it? And what would that do to change you? What would that do to your ego? What exactly is good and bad? Especially when you, as the will worker, dictate what good is and what bad is if you get strong enough. So essentially, to break it down more mechanically and less uh, philosophically, reality is dictated by the consensus. What the majority of the people on the planet believe is real is what is real. If you can sway enough of them to believe in the way you believe, then reality shifts to that. Uh, mages have a stronger strength of will than the average person, which allows them to work change that normal people could not. However, doing what you do in front of a large group of regular people has terrible side effects because the universe kicks back and says that's not how this works. So every time you do anything that changes reality, reality hurts you for it. It's called paradox. Mechanically, it's a stat you accrue that gets higher and higher until something really bad happens. Terrible luck. Sometimes you just explode. Sometimes you go mad and lose control of your power. Nothing good happens. Uh, so Mage of the Ascension in the setting we're playing way back in the 90s was designed to be a battle for whose vision of reality would be ascendant. And at this time in reality, it's a group called the Technocracy. Uh, they got wise a long, long time ago in the early medieval period that mages were out of control and there were all these places all over the world where a mage in his tower like Merlin could control all the people around him and bend the world to his will and there's nothing anybody could do about it. So the normal humans got sick of it and said, we're all going to agree to believe in the same thing and we're going to make it simple. And they created a thing called science. And uh, the technocracy over a period of about a thousand years convinced the whole world that science is real and magic is fake. So in the 90s, in the period of time that we were playing the technocracy is ascendant and are winning the Ascension War, McDonald's, light bulbs, cars, all of that is just magic they have convinced you is normal. But everyone believes it is. The secret war that happens between the technocracy and other kinds of mages happens with uh, T-1000s with miniguns coming out of their arms versus Harry Potter with his wand because the technocracy is light years ahead of normal people and what science is as they slowly but surely convince the world that everything they give them into the new invention is real. You are the very few left that still want the world to believe in imagination and possibility because the technocracy might have made the world safe from monsters. It may have made everything make sense and been able to give all kinds of wondrous things to the masses like electricity, like airplanes, like mass produced bread, but it came at a cost. The cost is there is no more imagination. There is no wonder. There is no more hope. People would rather sit at home, have their groceries deliver and eat Big Macs than go out and invent or go out and create or go out and make new art. You are what is called tradition mages who exist to try to keep that imagination alive. Uh, I'm not sure if a Subaru full of lesbian marmosets counts as imagination or not, but. So, uh, even within your own groups, even within the technocracy and within the traditions and within the name your group here of people who can change reality, there are subsets that still argue over how it should work. 
Each of you are a member of a different faction within the greater whole, and your faction thinks magic works a very different way than the person next to you in the same group. And even you as the individual within your faction probably disagree with other people in the faction, maybe even your own teacher on how reality should work. That is why the mages have not been able to do utterly change the world forever because you can't agree on anything. Kind of like real life. Which brings us to the second aspect of the World of Darkness games. They're part supernatural, but they're also part gothic horror. What that means in this instance isn't Frankenstein and Dracula. It means gritty streets, uh, gothic architecture. Everything's a little darker and a little scarier than our world, or at least it was in the 90s. Now their setting is actually kind of tame compared to the real world. Uh, but uh, it evokes a feeling of everything is horrible and hope is lost to the normal people. You're getting fired from your job. The one percenters are ruling the world. You can't even make ends meet unless you work two jobs with two roommates working two jobs each to pay for one apartment. You know, kind of like the real world. <laughs> it wasn't like that in the 90s when they made this setting. Uh, and the other side of that is punk, where you're the rebels. You're the ones who refuse to conform, go your own way, tell the world to uh, deal with it, and here's a big straw so they can suck it up. Uh, this creates a setting of gothic punk. It is an ideal setting for people like us, like Love Your Rebellion, like all us nerds, like uh, a world full of non-conformist, nerdy, not straight people to express ourselves. This is why we love the World of Darkness games. And this is how your characters exist too. You do stand out, you are the rebels, and most of society in the game world does not accept you. And some of them actively try to kill you. And there's a big meta explanation of World of Darkness for those of you in the audience, and more importantly in the game, who have never played any of these games before. Uh, mechanically speaking, uh, everything uses D10s. Your sheets will roll for you. But you create a pool of D10s, you roll them, you have a target number. If you equal or exceed the target number, you win. If you don't, you lose. <laughs> uh, so if you're looking at your sheets, you might see, I might say, punch that guy. So you're going to roll strength plus brawl. You're going to look at those bubbles. Those are your dice. So if you have two dots in strength and two dots in brawl, you have four D10s to roll. I'll tell you your difficulty is six. Any sixes and higher are successes. The more successes you get, the better you do. If you roll a 10, it counts as two successes. And in my games, kills all ones. If you roll a one, it takes away a success. If you roll no successes and roll ones, you fail terribly. You try to jump across buildings and fall and break your back, or whatever might happen. That's for normal things. When it comes to magical things, uh, you only ever roll your Arete, which all of you except Rhett have five dice. Jealousy has six. Uh, that is the dice pool for magic. Magic will have relatively the same difficulty as your normal rolls, give or take, but will require a lot more successes to work. Jumping across buildings, one success is enough. Three is perfect and five is extraordinary. Magic, five is probably barely enough. So this should tell you that a mage works better when they have time to prepare. On the fly, you're in trouble because you're just a squishy person building up that spell like a Hamikama for 50 episodes. But if you can spend three hours ahead of time preparing that spell so that when you get in the fight, all you have to do is release it, and then you're a deadly force of nature nothing can stop. That makes sense so far? Okay. Uh, Arate determines how many dice you have to roll magic, but your spheres, which on your sheet are above Arate, determine the kind of magic you understand. One dot is a basic understanding. You can expand your senses to a supernatural level. If you had one dot in forces, you have x-ray vision. You can see digital information moving across a telephone wire, maybe even read it. You can sense the heat in the street and figure out its temperature. If you had one dot in spirit, you can hear ghosts. You might be able to see the other side just a little bit, like moving shadows that are actually there. If you had one dot in correspondence, you could see the connections, like you could see the connection Ambrose has to Rachel while they're typing and see that they're good friends with your eyes. Uh, you might be able to tell someone's mood and how they're feeling with one dot in mind. You can tell if someone's sick and doesn't know it with one dot in life. 
So two dots means you can begin to affect small change on the world and uh, change on yourself. Two dots in life might mean you can make your plants grow faster or slower or heal a minor wound immediately. Cut yourself. Uh, cutting, uh, making uh, vegetables for dinner, you might be able to make the cut go away through force of will. Three dots in a sphere means you can affect great change on yourself and decent change on the world. And three dots, uh, you could probably, and three dots in life, you could probably control the length of your hair day to day and you could heal Rachel's wounds if she cut herself. Four dots means you're a master. Uh, at four dots in life, you could directly damage someone else's life pattern just by thinking about it. You could just cause lacerations to appear on a person because you're angry at them. You could take a bunch of seed trees and have a forest inside a week. At five dots, uh, you're considered an archmage and you are beyond the normal world and the world really starts disliking the fact that you're still here and haven't gone somewhere else away from Earth. At five dots in life, you can create new life forms if you had the appropriate other spirits to give them sentience and the ability to think. Uh, you could be a Bene Gesserit and predict when Paul Atreides was going to be born and make sure it happens. <laughs> uh, you could wither a plant from a tree back to a seedling in an instant. So that explains your dots. And now I'll go over each of the spheres real quick. The basic idea. Spirit is pretty self-explanatory. You can see and hear into the spirit world. Uh, other dimensions, other places that coincide with our world. Other realities. And at higher dots, you can affect them. You can walk back and forth. You can create or close portals, summon creatures. Life is what it sounds like. Forces means energy, but only energy in whatever form it takes. Lightning, fire, electricity, magnetism, gravity, radiation. Matter means physical objects that are inert and not alive. You can manipulate, you can make uh, a piece of wood hard as steel or a car door hinge rust and fall off. Correspondence means physical connections and emotional. So you can create, affect, break, or change the bond between people. It also means teleportation or being able to make your lightning bolt hit a guy 500 miles away. Uh, time is self-explanatory, but rewinding time, changing the past is very difficult. None of you have that level of power. So one of you is close though. Uh, prime is the energy source that connects everything. That's the soul. That is the, the divine spark, whatever you want to call it. You can do... Uh, it is more limited than the other spheres, but the things you can do with it are way more impressive. <laughs> uh. It also... Prime is... If you want to create something from nothing, you need a little bit of Prime to fuel it. If you're a forces mage and you want to cast a fireball, you need fire. Unless you have Prime, and then you can just create the fire. I missed one. Someone help me out. What I miss? Entropy. Entropy is the force of chance and decay. Not just death in the underworld, but also fate. Luck. So, those are what the spheres mean. So, think about those things and the dots you have in them. And when I present you with a scenario, you will say, I will say, uh, Oh, the giant cybernetic robot is about to shoot the minigun at you. What do you do? You can look at your dots and say, how can I combine these to do something cool to stop it? So if you had matter and forces, uh, you could say you're going to magnetize the robot and then uh, oh. everything metal in the room hits it and knocks it down or whatever. That's a poor you say, example. But... You say we're veterans of the Ascension War, right? Yes. Never try to magnetize the robot. It likely has counter magic. <laughs> Affect the things around it, not Correct. the robot itself. I That's would actually like a to... good rule of thumb in general with mages. Only affect the things around your target. Never go for your target, especially if it's a, a normal human. I would like to point out that um, for those of you who haven't played mage before who are in this game, don't worry if you can't memorize what the different spheres do. Don't worry if you don't remember how many successes it takes to do something in this game. We're all here to help you out, and it's just about enjoying 
each other and raising money for an amazing cause. Yep, I will be simplifying the rules for this game. Uh, Narf and uh, Jealousy will notice the most, maybe Rachel. But normally, like, if you want to... So if you follow mage rules to the core and you want to cast a spell, there's like 19 things we need to look at. For a one-shot, I'm just going to say, roll the dice. Did it work? Yes. If it's cool, I'm going to let it happen. That's your rule of thumb. If it's cool and your sheet says you can, I'll just let it happen. Uh, that's a big overview and a lot of information all at once. Does anyone have any questions? Can I have the I win button? No. Oh. But she donated the first $5. <laughs> she did. Oh, that reminds me. Someone else, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, also voted 20 bucks for dice. So I'm going to say that's two low tier boons and one mid tier boon. Somebody write that down. To punish us. That wasn't you. That was somebody else in this group. Yeah, no, I was in it for the Rosie's dice. I don't want to. Oh, miss I got it. I'm, with, I misread I'm that not trying sh- to. I'm not trying to buy my own game. No, but thank you to all the donators so far, which includes Rachel, Corey, Eric, and Geek Genesis. Thank you. Uh, to a question from the audience, we got the reason that the milestones are also listed as tiers is because in the milestones I can't type out all the details the tier needs that a tier lets you so the tier is just a way for me to elaborate on what the milestones are Zach (laughs) Tiltify gives you like 30 characters for a a milestone but like 500 for a tier Uh, okay so now let's talk about the characters a little bit uh, because this is a one shot, I basically handed you characters instead of you creating your own. Oh, Dre is giving you quintessence. Uh, no, Andre. Also, rem- uh, to clarify for the audience, because this is charity, all of rewards are party wide. I'm a benevolent god. So the group has two bonuses to quintessence, which means you can all add four more quintessence to your sheets. For uh, Angela and Jason, there's that wheel towards the bottom. And you've got like a bunch of weird pitchforks in it already at the top. Add four more pitchforks. Just go to the right. <laughs> Brilliant. Add four more pitchforks. Uh, quick overview. Tessence is basically your mana. Yeah. When you use that when you're casting a spell, it lowers the difficulty. It makes it easier to get the job done. But it's a finite resource. It's very hard to recharge. Since it's a one shot, though. Smoke them if you got them. I mean, we can just find a couple changelings and juice them. That's like a two shot just to find them, though. (laughs) Uh. So, a quick overview of characters for the audience. I'm going to start with Ambrose again, because I love ambushing you. Who are you? (laughs) What's the little bit of info I gave you, and what would you like to add to make it your own? Who am I? That is just the question I ask myself all the time. I have decided to name my character Kieran. Uh, pronouns are he or they. They like mine. Uh, you already know that, though. They're an assassin. So, you know, don't don't piss me off, I guess. Uh, got that entropy nice and high at uh, four dots. Uh, secondary sphere is spirit at three dots. And then I have kind of a mishmash of three others, which doubt that it'll come up much, but main two are the most important. Uh, essence is primordial nature. You know what that means? No, I have no idea. Okay, so that's new. That's a new mage. one for me. You all have avatar as a background. Lower left for Angela and Jason. Backgrounds are like your connect, like things about your character that are more than the average person has, whether mundane or not. Avatar is the magical spark. It's the inner you. You could consider it your soul. You could consider it your spirit guide. Whatever makes sense for how you view magic is what it is. The stronger avatar, 
is actually something you could see and interact with and talks to you and gives you advice and try to guide your life. A weaker avatar, it's just a nudge, a gut feeling, an instinct telling you this is what I should do. All of you are at three or four, which are fairly powerful, potent avatars. They can be seen and or heard in whatever form you want that to be. Uh, your essence is how your avatar thinks, breathes, and manifests and is the driving force behind you. Dynamic means change, adventure, quests, learning new things. It's how you exist, what you live for. Primordial means uh, either chaos and or rage, or it can also mean growth and or change at a dynamic, and not a dynamic, at a primordial base level. So change dynamically means I'm bored, I'm going to learn a new skill. Change primordially means I'm tired of this tree, I'm going to cut it down and grow three new ones from the roots. So it's more raw and brutal <laughs> form of that. Right. Um, pattern means you like things to stay the way they are. Things that never change and follow the same routine give you strength and give you purity of purpose. Uh, always pouring this potion the same way works perfectly every time, so the more you do it, the better you get at it. But if you change the formula, everything goes sideways. And then uh, entropic as a resonance, which I don't think any of you have, means uh, usually means you're a bad guy in the age world, but not necessarily. It means you feed off the inevitable heat death of the universe to power your effects. Continue. continue. Uh, also, nature and demeanor. I mean, the nature is who you really are. Demeanor is what you show the world. That's what drives your personality. And so, nature is monster. In this case, uh, being sociopath. <laughs> Yeah, fun times. Uh, I guess like John Wick, except for the love yes. for the dog. Um, demeanor is survivor. So seems like my character is deep down just very cold and uncaring. And uh, the outside is a facade of someone who is just trying to get by. We'll do whatever it takes to win. Yes. Uh, not necessarily uncaring, but cold, calculated, and whatever the mission is you believe in, nothing else matters. The ends justify the means is more accurate. Oh my accurate. god, chat, chat. I, I gotta give a shout out for that. John Wicca. <laughs> god damn it, Drea. <laughs> Drea, you're, you live in our Twitch chat now, just stay there. You're not allowed to be anywhere else. Um, <clears throat> ours, Aaron, can I have? Uh, uh, affiliation is traditions, which is, I'm... So, the traditions, in a meta sense, there's a council of nine mystic traditions, nine thoughts of how magic should work, that group together to resist science. That's all that really means. They sort of get along, but only when there's a common enemy. When there's not a common enemy, they kind of hate each other. And then, uh, sect is Chakravanti, which, uh, deal primarily in death and chaos. So, yep. Chakravanti as a sect uh, believe in entropy and they manipulate chance. Uh, if you've played the secret world, they're the dragon. Let's uh, throw the coins into the air and see how they land. And then when we figure it out, throw them into the air again. Uh, they excel as masters of fate, assassins. <laughs> they decide who lives and who dies. That's the kind of thing. And uh, let's see, my best stats are physicals, uh, second best mental. I'm just going to group. Yeah, you don't have right to there. read the dots. Uh, best thing is firearms. Yes, you are. To no one's World surprise. class. Now, again, for Angela and Jason, uh, dots. Some things, no dots doesn't mean anything. No dots in drive, no dots in computer. You can still go to work in your car. You can still surf Facebook. A dot means you have skill. That's true for most of these. One dot means... Your skill is okay, you're still figuring it out. Three dots means you're a veteran. Five dots means you're probably the best in the world. So Ambrose having four dots and firearms means his character is one of the best sharpshooters that exist. Uh, one dot in strength means human average. Uh, some people say two, I like one. Three dots means uh, you're actually a bodybuilder and probably could win weightlifting tournaments. Five dots means you could one punch knock out uh, Schwarzenegger at his prime. Uh, for the other attributes, 
the ones that don't seem self-explanatory. The difference between intelligence and wits is intelligence is uh, when learning and knowledge matters. Wits is means when clever thinking matters. Perception means what you notice. Charisma is force of personality. It doesn't mean necessarily sweet. It just means you're not being scary and you're not lying when you get your way. Manipulation means you're being devious, but it also doesn't have to be lying. It could be you just know how to make that person dance to your tune. The skills are where you start getting into like lying versus not lying. Expression would mean the lyrics to your song make people cry. Subterfuge means you're lying or figuring out if they're lying to you. <laughs> so if you're not sure on what uh, skill or uh, attribute means, just ask and we'll clarify it. But generally, they're self-explanatory. Carry on, Ambrose. Um, I think that about covers it. I got three yep. dots in Arcane, three in Avatar, etc., etc. Um, you wanted me to make up a little something, right? Yeah. What the, the little basically what I'm looking for is the little backstory I gave everyone, and if you choose to elaborate or not. I don't remember receiving a backstory. So, you're, uh, so if you scroll down. You can develop your backstory on page two from how you do magic. Ugh. Wait. <laughs> on page two on the right. Yours is your paradigm is everything is chaos, which means the oh, way right. you view the universe, you only think it makes sense. There's no meaning to creation except that which you create or the will you impose upon it. Order only exists when we make it. You dictate what is real. Your practice, which is how you transform what you believe into reality, is chaos magic. The classical fusty symbols of mystery can be reworked with modern gods, cultural touchstones, and ideas to remix, remix magic into new fun forms. Some dirty dishwater, a couple spoons, and that guy's uh, singing voice can create magic for you. Chaos magic, it could be as silly as that, Although that starts to intrude on gutter magic, but it could also be chaos magic in the actual Western mysticism sense of chaos magic. Uh, and then your instruments are how your practice works physically, because uh, until you become a super master mage, you have to have something to focus on to make your will reality. So you would use cards, dice, and or instruments of chance that you invent in your head. Transgression, which means breaking the rules. Weapons, like your gun and enhanced perceptions, which means you could have your lucky scope that is magical for you. So those are general ideas that you can make specific. So you're an assassin who believes, why shouldn't I get paid to kill people? It doesn't matter anyways. All that matters is the mark I leave and the order I bring to the world because of the jobs I pick and the bad guys I choose to pick off. That could be your story or whatever you want it to be. But as a tradition mage, most of your targets would be technocracy or monsters. Ooh, you know what? Yeah, um, gonna it's my job to take out technocracy. Sorry, Narf. <laughs> he, uh... I got it during my intro. I'll explain that a bit. Yeah, I was gonna say. I think he, your assassin, he wouldn't. He would be able to differentiate between an etherite and like a virtual adept versus a true technocrat <laughs> just having technology doesn't make you a technocrat oh no i know but that's like one of narf's favorites oh yes speaking of which you're next narf oh all right so we've got professor gray which uh let's start out by thinking about like doc brown from back to the future um, but instead of like all the electronics and stuff around, it's more of like a chemistry lab. And they're really into like transmutation and like strengthening materials. Um, they're, they seem to be like a, an innovator uh, is their demeanor. So they, they stand out as a um, like person who has very clever ideas on the spot um, and a bit of a mad scientist by nature. Uh, a dynamic essence, so just flowing with the wind, like the water through the the the, the world, and uh, the concept is kind of an eccentric inventor. Uh, the spheres uh, we've got. Uh, oh, uh, Cabal would be um, 
the, the Society of Ether used to be, uh, it's gone through many names, but actually the Society of Ether um, is kind of an offshoot of something that helped start the technocracy long ago. But they have long since made, we are just an, a, every bit an enemy to the technocracy as any other tradition. But since, uh, since we do have a little bit of an edge in the fact that our magic is still very science-based, uh, it's a, it tends to be a lot more believable by the consensus. Uh, it's a little easier to get away with a tech the gadget than a than a than a pointy hat uh, in the common days. And so uh, the professor takes uh, advantage of that quite often. Um, Paradigm is a mechanistic cosmos, so everything everything is part of a giant machine there's a there's a you know hog and a plan and etc uh practice is weird science so you know through enlightened chemistry and uh fancy gadgets uh instruments devices and machines uh just energy uh etc oh also uh has a bit of correspondence prime time and forces as well yeah, so I can just go science. What's the uh, name of your energy? Hmm. I said, "What's the name of your energy? What's the only one that matters?" Uh, quintessence. At, at ether, this point, probably ether. Yeah. The reason the ether actually the technocracy, technocracy is technocracy decided ether wasn't real. Did you know, by the way, that the word quintessence uh, is fifth essence, which would be the fifth element? Um, <laughs> and and the fifth element in traditional Greek uh, al alchemy is ether. Uh, just so oh, you know, that's hilarious. I did not know that. I mean, you could say it's an ether or situation. It is. Rachel, wah, you're next. Wah. Hello. So I am playing a member of the Celestial Chorus. Uh, who are essentially written to be like the religious mages, the uh, mages from the Abrahamic faiths. Uh, so uh, I am playing a theological anthropologist, so I sort of assume that this is the character who's looking for the unifying divine principle yes. behind everything. You picked up what uh, I was putting down. Yeah, her avatar manifests as a white dove and the scent of roses, because why wouldn't it? Uh, her paradigm is divine order and earthly chaos, so essentially heaven's got its shit together, uh, the earth is in a fallen state, let's go fix it. Um, and so uh, her practice is faith and prayers, she uses a lot of symbols, uh, a lot of names, a lot of blessings, and curses. And her biggest strength is Prime. Yes, I've got uh, four dots in Prime, and then I've got three dots in Spirit, and then a smattering of Correspondence, Forces, and Mind. You're next, Jealousy. Give us some goth. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Jealousy... Uh, is from a tradition called the Hollow Ones, where the where the goth kids of the nineties, where the goth kids of the nineties, where the squat, where the squat dwellers, where the runaways, where the marginal ones, the seed kids, who found a dingy old book on magic in the gutter one night and took it home and scrawled on magic marker on drywall and it came to life. Um, Jealousy is the proprietor of a New Age shop called Strange Trails. Uh, Jealousy was always that kind of person who, um, you know, was the kind who got kicked out of the really snooty independent record store and was like, well, fine then, I'll go start my own record store where my opinions matter. And that's basically how Jealousy ended up running a New Age shop. Um, Jealousy's sort of roots as being like a punk scene kid are still there. Uh, Jealousy practices something called gutter magic, which is literally gather random bits of trash and 
a particularly good rock you found for drawing on the sidewalk and just make it happen. It doesn't have to be fancy, it just has to be magic. Which is why, you know, Jealousy's carrying everything from, you know, a wonderful, like, beautiful gemmed Kabbalah necklace all the way down to a random baby that they found. You know, every trinket matters, every little thing is a little piece of the divine because at the end of the day, Jealousy is a, a visionary who believes that all of us are gods in disguise. Um, and desperately, desperately wants to see people elevate beyond that. But, you know, on the way, you got to make a buck, right? Um, <laughs> in terms of mundanity, uh, jealousy, uh, really good at the social things, uh, pretty streetwise. Also, probably knows more than you do about the occult. Come on, right? I mean, I run the bookshop, after all. Um, and then, magically, uh, if you want things jacked up at a distance, like, I'm the one to call. Uh, I've got plenty of correspondence, plenty of forces, plenty of entropy. I can make things decay at a distance. And then I got a little bit of life and uh, enough spirit and time to see ghosts in the future if I want to. Perfect, thank you. And I wasn't laughing at you. I was laughing at this donation. I'm going to let this one go because it's funny. So, uh, everyone gets, wow, even more quintessence. It's a lot. You basically fill your wheel, except Ambrose, who is going to get 10 points paradox for your ten. puns. 10. 10? Yep. You're starting with 10 paradox. You're going to explode at the end. What? That's a lot just for Angela and Jason. <laughs> That's a lot. Apparently, you're being punished. Okay, look, but, but, Zach didn't put an amount of quintessence. It's based on the donation. Son of a... <laughs> well, that amount would be 12 quintessence and 10 paradox. Paradox isn't necessarily personal, just so y'all know. Donator. <laughs> the amount of paradox hanging in the room is kind of hanging over all of us. It's fine. So, having heard all that, uh, for Angela and Jason, uh, either you can describe, or if you want me to, I can do it. You let me know. We'll start with Angela. I'm gonna try. And if you're, no, that's wrong. Just <laughs> that's also fine. But I think okay. I, I think I get it. Um, so my character's name is Moxie, um, and um, her nature is essentialist. That that goes beyond the realm of the physical. It's also about um, being in tune with the oneness of the universe and, and time, space, and the human consciousness. Um, she Her cabal is cult of ecstasy, which I'm also extrapolating as more like cult of joy. So like, you know, the ecstaticness of life, um, that, that yeah. creative power uh, of an artist, which she also is, that's her demeanor, is artist. Um, the concept of the character is famous musician. Um, and that that's gonna, for me, that'll be an interesting twist. So um, forgive me if you, if you hate this, but I've been watching the Umbrella Academy. So my brain is concocting an amalgamation of characters, um, like a version of Klaus with the level of charisma and ability to um, be socially, uh, um, really good with people, um, and Allison's ability, but with music. So okay. my character has a high level of, um, social attributes, charisma, man manipulation, and appearance. Um, and, uh, one of her instruments is music. So it's my voice. So as like a famous musician, the charisma and the, the manipulation, quote unquote, are found in the persuasion of how lovely my voice sounds when I speak, when I um, when I uh, sing. So that's the instrument is voice rather than like guitar or whatever. Um, so I have like, let's see what else I have um, in my abilities. Uh, expression is my highest talent. So again, this all wraps into, like basically the, the sound of my voice can like tap into the oneness of the collective unconsciousness, that part of your brain that synthesizes when you hear music. 
that's that's like what my what she does when she sings and she's it's just one name moxie like madonna you know um <laughs> sort of like that kind of vibe um her sphere so uh, her her highest is time so along with this ability to have charisma with the voice um, she also is able to manipulate time in the sense that music is, has time signatures. Um, so, you know, as like she's singing, she can um, make things go four beats back, four beats forward, but like incrementally, very slowly, like in seconds, not in like large chunks, if that makes sense. Um, so that's kind of what I'm adding there in a way, interpreting that. Um, so expression also comes in the form of the tattoos and piercings. So I, I can also draw inspiration from that um, for like instruments of charisma and appearance. Um, yeah, and so that's, that's I mean, t is that, is that, is there anything else anybody wants to know? Is, is that good? We pretty um, much nailed it, yeah. Cool. As a musician, time magic is because that perfect moment when the audience is screaming and you hit that perfect note, you can make that last days. Yeah, it's like a timeless experience. So she can kind of like move seconds of time or delay seconds of time. Yeah, you nailed it. All right, Jason. All right, I may need your help, Tyler, but I'll, All right. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. You ready? Okay, yep. Uh, Lungayo uh, Lung uh, Tadej Barnes, he goes by Lungayo. He is from a long line of his ancestors that studied the land. He's a fish and wildlife agent that was one that was running one of the most uh, uh, best agency on fish and wildlife prior to this takeover. And over time, his family and most of his people were killed. And so mm -hmm. now he has survived living off the land. His, his affiliation is tradition. His essence is questing. Uh, his nature is profit. And he's a survivor uh, with perception, intelligence, and wits being his uh, one of his most prominent attributes with strength coming close by. Uh, his enigma is really high. Survival is at the, at the place where uh, uh, it should be when it comes to his knowledge to be able to do that. One of his uh, most successful spheres is time. And so one of the thing he's, uh, things he's learned from his ancestors and learned from nature is the ability to slow his breath down and be able to concentrate in such a way where he can almost see the future a couple seconds before it happens. That's all I got. That's really cool. Thank you. Uh, yep. You've also got a spattering of correspondence prime in mind, which means you're really good at focusing and concentration. You can sense the oneness between things and the connections. And your highest sphere is spirit, which means uh, you have a very close connection to the spiritual world. You can speak to spirits. You can have them come to you. You can calm them down and try to talk to them. When, when you get mad, it's probably kind of scary. <laughs> uh, don't wanna don't 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 wanna make that guy mad in his own house. And then your second highest is life, which means part of surviving. Good with animals, good with nature. Go a long time without food for me too. Otherwise, yeah, you nailed it too. Naturals, both of you. I'm not even kidding. Uh some of you have uh can't think of words merits merits and flaws some of you don't uh i'll skip down those for those of you that do since i have uh jason's sheet open he chose one of the ones that actually had potentially one of the most important merits to this one shot you have a permanent paradox flaw that is a flaw not a merit what that means is you a crude paradox at some point in your life maybe the day your family was killed you did vulgar magic which means obvious magic and reality punished you for it we can figure out what that is but the easiest thing for your character is probably you're constantly haunted by a spirit that never leaves you alone <laughs> and can create effects around you like things get cold people feel a little creeped out that kind of thing and then your merit is storm warden 
So the thing that happens in the mage world in the 90s is uh, the Avatar Storm, when something really, really bad happened because of the technocracy, basically. They broke every dimension that existed with a bomb. And uh, it tore, ho tore holes between all dimensions, and there's a howling storm of angry spirits and ghosts and demons, whatever nasty thing you can imagine tearing through every realm. And to pass between realms, you have to survive that storm. You have a natural ability to resist it and a natural ability to navigate it, which is extremely rare. For uh, Moxie, uh, you have alcohol and drug tolerance, which means if the technocrats catch you and shoot you up, <laughs> sure, just another day for you. <laughs> uh, artistically gifted, which means you get boosts on any artistic role for your music. Time sense, which means you always know exactly what time it is, no matter what. And then your flaws are vice grip, which means one of your vices has almost total control over you. So it's like, not an addiction like uh, smoking, but more like it has to be part of your life or you're not who you are. You can pick what that vice is, it does not matter. Uh, compulsion would be for that vice. And then special responsibility is because of your fame level. You have four dots in fame, which in the world of darkness means you have the same level of fame as, uh, not Mariah Carey, but uh, Shakira, or uh, somebody else could be another four dot fame name. Matthew McConaughey, but not necessarily Tom Hanks. So like when you walk up to the party, they're all gonna know who you are just by looking at you, unless you go to great lengths to hide it. But also so will the mundane world, which means uh, the traditions very much look to you to be an example of what it is to be a mage. And also that means you got to be especially careful not to do obvious magic because someone's always looking at you. And now for everyone else, I imagine you can figure out your flaws and merits. If not, let me know. I'll tell you what they are, what it means. I'm assuming uh, the deep sleeper flaw means that I have a hard time waking up. Correct, and your dreams are easily manipulated. I was curious about the wonder. Ah, yes, the backgrounds. Uh, I think more than one of you had wonder. Who had wonder besides Professor Gray? Jealousy did, okay. All right, so let's start with uh, Professor Gray. I was waiting to give them out based on who picked what character. Uh, you have an ether tracking clockwork uh, owl. It's about this big. Runs on ether, which means quintessence. Uh, it's a clockwork device, so the whole thing is like a steampunk machine. And it tracks uh, quintessence and paradox. Uh, so anyone who is awakened, uh, when you activate the device, its eyes emit a three-dimensional hologram, and you can all interpret based on that hologram where the nearest sources of quintessence are and where the most dangerous sources of paradox are. And it will also allow you, if Professor Gray makes a successful Arate plus science role, uh, allow you to determine what deter what uh, sets reality where you're at, which will tell you what will accrue paradox and what will not. Because in the streets of New York, reality is the normal reality, but in the technocratic construct, they decide what reality is based on science. So he can give, uh, they can give you uh, early warning on what will fuck you up with your magic. Also, it has a self-destruct, which will explode with eight dots of prime, causing aggravated damage. Or eight dots of prime damage that's aggravated if you need it to. What that means outside of mechanics is it's a kind of damage that's impossible to resist that is incredibly hard to heal. Kills everything. Okay. Jealousy. Bottle of fire. You can decide how you got this or where it came from. It is a squat bottle of red glass that stands four inches high. When you take the brass stopper out and turn it upside down, and you roll Arate, uh, a liquid pours out, kind of like 
napalm that moves away from you at uh, several feet per turn. You direct which way it goes and everything it touches burns. When you're done, call it back, goes back in the bottle. It's possible I could have invented that. It is possible, yes. You can also blow that up too if you need for massive damage. Be careful. <laughs> okay, anybody else need anything else explained from their sheets? So. Switch to some different music real quick. Uh, you all received a very strange message it is going to bring you all together because you are all from different groups. This will be the first time any of you have met each other. Uh, you all, each of you has a cabal, which is a fancy term for your group of mages, your friends that you hang out with, live with, and do things with. Uh, whatever city or remote area you're from, you have a connection to one or more of uh, mages like you. It could be as few as two, could as be as many as six. Usually not more than that because there's only one of you for every few million people. Uh, it's a short film could have been mailed to you as an actual VHS or a CD could have been an email you got you can decide how you got it if you got it as an email it's called sphinx42.mpg uh, you cannot make any arcane connections to the sender even with high correspondence rating it's scrubbed completely clean uh When you play it, it's a black and white film that begins with the image of a Sphinx above the following words. Sphinx Productions present the spirit of 42. Then it's a newsreel style black and white film showing five members of something called Situation 6 waving and shaking hands. World War II people, but they look like mages, like they're eccentric. It's like Captain America's Avengers in World War II style. Waving and shaking hands with distinguished men and women in opposing rows in severe suits and dour archaic robes. The film has a jerky antique quality. It's like a wedding where they're all Harry Potter on one side and all suits on the other. And these guys are walking down the middle shaking everyone's hands and being super friendly. Uh, a voiceover says, Enigma takes us where dogma cannot, as unionists and traditionalists band together against the Axis threat. No cabal since the first cabal has inspired such excitement among the awakened as Situation 6, even though there's only five of them, shown here, greeting enlightened dignitaries from around the world, founded in 1942, and then the voiceover is cut off and replaced the handheld shot of a computer screen that has an email from Alan Cordwainer to management. Uh, subject Situation 6 Retirement. Sir, Situation 6 related assets have been retired with the exception of Operation Nine Men and of course the deviant Mondial who's been missing since 1946. Nine Men's whereabouts are unknown at this time. Other retirees experienced plausible decommissioning, dementia, heart failure, cancer, schizoid episodes from previous drug use. This is a technocratic way of saying we killed them. I recommend that these retirements be kept under strictest confidence. The war years are a delicate period of history, especially when wartime assets are concerned. Some historical de reconstruction may be unavoidable. This means they're trying to rewrite what happened across reality. As old propaganda paints assets as heroes or allies. Operations suggest a high possibility nine men may release Operation Spark Maker data to terrorists. Terrorist means you. Attached as a disbursement request, for necessary resources to reacquire or retire this asset. Scene cuts to a worn out looking, but youngish man in a dated black suit. Uh, off camera, someone's asking him questions like an interviewer. The interviewer says, you're called situation six, but only five of you are here. Where's Dr. Mondial? Uh, nine men answers, the doctor's getting ready for the big push into Bastogne. The proletariat allies have done their job. So the doctor wants to make sure we can match it and give the Hun another black eye to match the one pounded in by Yank tanks. There's a second of blackness, then an official looking seal that includes the symbol for Prime, which you would all recognize, appearing over the following words. 
the Wellsburg Tribunal Proceedings in Dachau in June 13th of 1946. Over a dozen men and women sit at a very long table. Many of them are the same ones you saw them greeting earlier in the film. One distinguished older person stands and looks past the camera saying, Alois Richter and the Falter Brunin Cabal, you are guilty of crimes in Imago Infernalis. That means they dealt with demons. That means they're nefandi. That's even worse than technocracy. That is, you performed acts like under those committed by servants of oblivion. Regardless of whether you've entered into any pact or association with them, you should be held until such time as sentences of Gilgo are carried out. Gilgo is the worst punishment in mage society. It's worse than death. They rip your soul out and make you not magical. May your gods have mercy on your soul. There's one final cut to what appears to be an examination table with a corpse on it covered in striated burns and cuts. The marks on the body suggest some sort of panicked writing, but the language is incomprehensible. But also, this is a, you, it kind of looks like a paradox backlash you're all familiar with. A lot of times, paradox backlashes manifest as spontaneous lacerations on a mage. A dispassionate voice speaks in German, while masked doctors turn the body over and gesture to particularly severe points of trauma. Leaning against the wall, a man in an SS uniform cleans his nails with a knife. The voiceover says, when directed into the fountain, capital F, energy from the camp interacts with subjects who cross over into supernormal realms by their own power or through the intercession of others. Before death, this prisoner described it as a curtain of bright razors. If properly harnessed, this could serve as a potent defense against the Reich's occult enemies. Then credits roll. The listing for every credit, but one is gibberish. The last credit is A. Benedict, conflicted secret agent Jason Nineman. Then at the conclusion of the credits, it says, filmed in San Francisco, where Enigma takes you, because dogma cannot. When the film ends, it self-destructs. It deletes itself or catches on fire like a Mission Impossible movie if you had a physical copy. When you report this to your superiors, whoever it is that runs your cabal in the tradition, uh, they all act like it's a big deal, but don't give you any information other than to tell you to head to San Francisco and that you should all spend the day at Disney where you will find others of your kind who you should work with to figure out why this was sent now and what it means and what the importance of the video is. So you all headed to Disneyland. And you all met up in the Star Wars attraction, building lightsabers. That's where the scene begins. You follow your senses, using your one dots in your spheres to tell you oh, magic is this way. A lot of it. So the six of you are all in the Star Wars attraction at Disneyland, building lightsabers, eyeballing each other. But no one has said anything yet. This is where we begin. The scene now belongs to all of you. I'm busy arguing with the clerk. What do you mean you don't have a perfectly black lightsaber emitter crystal? Look <laughs> at me. Do I look like I can settle for purple? Fine, fine. Uh, so... Joan is dressed in uh, long skirts, sensible shoes, hair scarf, over which she has a set of mini mouse ears uh, that she clearly just purchased. Uh, and she's having some fun. She's getting to let her hair down a little bit at Disneyland and letting all the positive vibes get her a little giggly. Uh, and she is having fun uh, building a lightsaber uh, colored reddish, orangish, yellowish, you know, St. Michael's flaming sword type. Brilliant. Professor Gray was building a lightsaber, but then they started taking it apart to see how the, how the light system worked. And they're currently doing something that you think they might be attaching a new emitter to the the, the coil? You're you're not sure. You're uh, installing an actual kyber crystal into it. Yeah, right. I mean, I have the spheres possible that I could I could make it work probably in my hand at least. 
I think I might actually be able to make this thing work. There's a clerk trying desperately to find a black lightsaber piece. The clerk trying to stop Professor Gray not having any luck. What about uh I mean Kenny, I already paid Boxy for it. and uh Lingile. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, Kieran is oh sorry, I heard someone. No, I was just gonna say Lingile is uh, uh mumbling to himself around how back in the day these these were all made with real nature and animals and the, the light that emits and doesn't understand why we're building these uh lightsabers. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just trying to fit in. <laughs> uh, Moxie is late. Um, and she arrives kind of cloaked like, like Jackie Onassis with big glasses and a scarf over her head, trying to make sure she doesn't get noticed coming in. Um, and she's utterly bored with the idea of building a lightsaber. So she is practicing the um, vocal parts for the music, the Star Wars music that is playing overhead. You all recognize each other as Awakened and can interact as you see fit. Anyone who actually walks up to Moxie and gets a close look will recognize her. Like recognizing a rock star. I slide up the counter towards Joan and look at the lightsaber and just say my flaming sword like that and I pull out my Kabbalah necklace could carve all the way from the crown to the kingdom and then just let it drop Who is how does Joan react to that I mean, she knows what he's getting at, but um, I, I don't know that uh, she would have a specific contribution. Okay. What were you going to say, Professor Gray? I was, I was just asking for clarification who was being talked to. Oh. But I figured it out. Everyone else is making these awesome lightsabers and Kieran's trying to assemble it. Every time he goes to turn it on, it just fizzles out like it might spark or it might just do this draining uh, with, with the light. But everything he seems to touch just fizzles out. Yeah, I was going to say, I've got Prime 1. Does the, the shadow hanging over Kieran... Like, is it palpable or? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, because uh, I also have the flaw touch of chaos. Yeah. Did yes. uh, Did you fall through a chaos pit on your way here, sir? Your 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 vibes a little. Right. Well, that's uh, that's a concern of yours. Oh, here, let me help. And I'll send a little bit of Prime through Kieran's lightsaber to make it glow. It's red. What color does it glow? Red? It's oh. red. <laughs> I like how Corey's just rubbing their eyes like a <laughs> Why did they tell us to meet at Disney? I like look over and try to wait for all of the like the people to not be looking. We should find some place we can talk. It's the Magic Kingdom. Nailed it. <laughs> I suppose. Excellent to blend in. Also, people maybe here would believe just about anything that happens. I mean, also, earlier you said that we couldn't juice changelings for quintessence because we would struggle to find them. We know they're here. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Not only that. And you wonder why small world shut down. You're welcome. It's 
Oh, that's my favorite <laughs> ride. It's got a good message. Moxie uh, sidles up to the what's what Jason's character's pronunciation? Legile. Legile, uh, because she thinks that he'll be the least likely to recognize her. So she sidles up next to him and whispers really quietly, do you know why we're here? Lungile. Voice sounds familiar, but you can't quite place it. Lungile recognizes the voice, but doesn't doesn't know where to place it. But the first thing he thinks is, the only thing that's been sticking out, as he says to Moxie, is, why did they say six and we only saw five? That always confused me about that video. What were your thoughts? Well, it was the doctor that was missing. The madness obviously got to him. Uh, you look around and realize, all of you, there's a strange lull once you start discussing the video where you're the only ones for this moment in the building. You and the clerks who have all wandered off behind the desk. So for a moment, it is only the six of you in the middle of a busy theme park in a summer afternoon. So, Moxie, why don't you hit that Arate button for me? Hey. Uh, I don't exactly know what I'm doing. Um, There's a uh, bunch of like little rectangle buttons uh -huh. in the top of your character sheet. There's primary gear, backgrounds, roads, other. Initiative, Arate. And you're going to hit that one. Okay. So I submit that, and then it says input value description. Uh, just put uh, time stop. <laughs> it's just basically so if you do a bunch of rolls all at once, I'll know who's doing what and why. That's what that's for. And then DP mod input value. Five. Difficulty. Five. Okay. Two tens, a one, an eight, an eight, a nine, and a nine. That's a good roll. Okay. I rolled too many dice, but I think I told you the wrong DP mod. <laughs> it's fine. You are able to slow down this moment so you can have an ice-breaking conversation while you're alone. Um... And I choose who I, I, I pick in that moment to have the ice-breaking conversation? Uh, yeah, it can be one of them or all six if you want to talk to everyone, all six of you. All right. So um, Moxie chooses to talk to all six and reveal herself because she's chosen to only speak to the other mages in the room. Um, um, possible? Uh -huh. And to give you and uh, Jason an idea of how magic can work so you can do your own cool descriptions later uh you just pick a cool note a melancholy note one that makes everyone feel like happy but also longing like the end of a long happy vacation in the summer and you sing that note and you let it go but it keeps moving through the room slowly 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 fading away but the air is vibrating with it and, that's and you can all feel time slow down and, and that's the time stop yes okay um, so, uh, I reveal myself, you know, and to the, to the other five in the room and, um, I decide that it, to introduce myself, even though everybody knows who I am, <laughs> which sounds right. Um, in case you haven't noticed, um, I'm Moxie and I've come a very long way to be here. And I just really want to know if any of you understand what the point of this meeting is. I slowed down time in, for this and everything, so. Uh, Lungile, it takes you a second and somebody in the room has to say a specific song and you're like, oh. And for any of the other four of you, if you're into punk rock, you're probably starstruck. No celebrity could be useful for a mission like this. 
Well, I mean, think think about it. They'd, they'd be starstruck. I, I imagine you all are. No? I mix choices on the inside. <laughs> well, that's excited somewhere. So that works for me. Any- Guile paused for a minute because he remembers hearing Moxie's voice on his daughter's uh, radio right before she oh. uh, went to her death. And that song plays My over and over again. Oh. Is jealousy into this music scene? I I reel back at, at, at like that revelation, like I reel back on my, 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 my fanishness and just <laughs> another time. <laughs> professor Gray, do you even listen to music? I was going to say, uh, the professor says, I-, I think one of my students played me one of your songs once, but I'm, I mostly listen to classic while working. What about Joan? What kind of music does Joan listen to? Uh, so... Joan is celestial chorus, and so she is looking for uh, the divine song that makes all of creation go. So probably the most expensive thing she owns is uh, early adopter of the MP3 player with a little <laughs> bit of everything on it. Uh, when Moxie does ask, why are we all here? You all were told, find these other mages at Disneyland in San Francisco figure out the importance of the video. You each will sent from your cabals because you are the most experienced and strongest member of your cabal. You don't know why your six cabals were chosen to receive the video. You don't know what Sphinx is. But you do get some key takeaways, which is Operation Sparkmaker, Situation 6, the Wellsburg Tribunal, and Nine Men, which is a bunch of World War II stuff most of you have probably never heard of. We will pause here for our mid-show breaks so where everyone can refresh themselves. When we come back, we'll do some research and then we'll go punch some monsters. So don't go anywhere, audience. We'll be back in about five or 10 minutes. Hi, I'm Angela Page, the founder and the chair of the board of directors of Love Your Rebellion, a 501c3 that empowers marginalized groups through the arts including women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQIA communities, people from low-income communities, and people with disabilities by creating opportunities in the arts that employ, discover, and assist. Before I tell you more about Love Your Rebellion, let me tell you a little bit about my background and expertise. Prior to founding Love Your Rebellion, I spent nine years teaching English, creative writing, and sociology in higher education. I hold a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Creative Writing from the University of Central Florida and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative and Critical Writing from Goddard College with a specialization in feminist theory and poetry. I'm also a professional musician with experience in live performance and audio production. My studies and my time in the classroom showed me how different life can be based on things like race, gender, sexual orientation, orientation, ethnicity, ability, and class. But I learned those life experiences pretty early on. The distinct overlap of being the child of a gay Italian-American parent really exemplified to me how inaccessible the world can be to someone who's part of one or more marginalized groups. The problems LYR seeks to solve are lack of opportunities in the arts and lack of accessible arts experiences for people from marginalized groups. The organization takes on this problem by creating programming through an approach we've coined called Diversity First. So instead of creating programming and then figuring out how to make it diverse, LYR begins with diversity in mind, then we create programming from that perspective. Diversity First also maintains that at least 80% of artists, writers, and performing artists contracted, provided exposure, or assistance via Love Your Rebellion self-identify as women, immigrants, people of color, people from queer and trans communities, people from low-income communities, and or people with disabilities. Love Your Rebellion's Dean Library is an ongoing example of diversity first programming. Zines chosen for the library showcase varying identities, experiences, languages, and cultures. Library entrance is free. In fact, 
all LYR programming is free or low cost in order to make arts experiences more accessible. Love Your Rebellion Zine Library falls in the 33905 zip code of Lee County. 35% of the residents are Hispanic and 65% of the residents are non-Hispanic or Latino. 37% of the residents are unemployed. There are so many more programs that LYR has developed using Diversity First. I encourage you to visit our website, loveyourrebellion.org, or our social media pages at Love Your Rebellion to get a more in-depth look at the impact and the range of our multidisciplinary arts programming, developing programming for from a diversity first approach lowers the barrier to access for opportunities in the arts and experiences in the arts, allowing Love Your Rebellion to empower artists, writers, and performing artists from marginalized groups. Once again, I'm Angela Page, the chair of the board of directors for Love Your Rebellion, and I just really want to thank you for your time and consideration. Hi, I'm Angela Page, the founder and the chair of the board of directors of Love Your Rebellion, a 501c3 that empowers marginalized groups through the arts, including women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQIA communities, people from low-income communities, and people with disabilities by creating opportunities in the arts that employ, discover, and assist. Before I tell you more about Love Your Rebellion, let me tell you a little bit about my background and expertise. Prior to founding Love Your Rebellion, I spent nine years teaching English, creative writing, and sociology in higher education. I hold a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Creative Writing from the University of Central Florida and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative and Critical Writing from Goddard College with a specialization in feminist theory and poetry. I'm also a professional musician with experience in live performance and audio production. My studies and my time in the classroom showed me how different life can be based on things like race, gender, sexual orientation, orientation, ethnicity, ability, and class. But I learned those life experiences pretty early on. The distinct overlap of being the child of a gay Italian-American parent really exemplified to me how inaccessible the world can be to someone who's part of one or more marginalized groups. The problems LYR seeks to solve are lack of opportunities in the arts and lack of accessible arts experiences for people from marginalized groups. The organization takes on this problem by creating programming through an approach we've coined called Diversity First. So instead of creating programming and then figuring out how to make it diverse, LYR begins with diversity in mind, then we create programming from that perspective. Diversity First also maintains that at least 80% of artists, writers, and performing artists contracted, provided exposure or assistance via Love Your Rebellion self-identify as women, immigrants, people of color, people from queer and trans communities, people from low-income communities, and or people with disabilities. Love Your Rebellion's Dean Library is an ongoing example of diversity first programming. Zines chosen for the library showcase varying identities, experiences, languages, and cultures. Library entrance is free. In fact, all LYR programming is free or low cost in order to make arts experiences more accessible. Love Your Rebellion Zine Library falls in the 33905 zip code of Lee County. 35% of the residents are Hispanic and 65% of the residents are non-Hispanic or Latino. 37% of the residents are unemployed. There are so many more programs that LYR has developed using Diversity First. I encourage you to visit our website, loveyourrebellion.org, or our social media pages at Love Your Rebellion to get a more in-depth look at the impact and the range of our multidisciplinary arts programming, developing programming from a diversity first approach lowers the barrier to access for opportunities in the arts and experiences in the arts, allowing Love Your Rebellion to empower artists, writers, and performing artists from marginalized groups. Once again, I'm Angela Page, the chair of the board of directors for Love Your Rebellion, and I just really want to thank you for your time and consideration. Hi, I'm Angela Page the founder and the chair of the board of directors of Love Your Rebellion, a 501c3 that empowers marginalized groups through the arts, including women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQIA communities, people from low-income communities, and people with disabilities by creating opportunities in the arts that employ, discover, and assist. Before I tell you more about Love Your Rebellion, let me tell you a little bit about my background and expertise. Prior to founding Love Your Rebellion, I spent nine years teaching English, creative writing, and sociology in higher education. I hold a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Creative Writing from the University of Central Florida and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative and Critical Writing from Goddard College with a specialization in feminist theory and poetry. I'm also a professional musician with experience in live performance and audio production. 
My studies and my time in the classroom showed me how different life can be based on things like race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, ability, and class. But I learned those life experiences pretty early on. The distinct overlap of being the child of a gay Italian American parent really exemplified to me how inaccessible the world can be to someone who's part of one or more marginalized groups. The problems LYR seeks to solve are lack of opportunities in the arts and lack of accessible arts experiences for people from marginalized groups. The organization takes on this problem by creating programming through an approach we've coined called diversity first. So instead of creating programming and then figuring out how to make it diverse, LYR begins with diversity in mind, then we create programming from that perspective. Diversity First also maintains that at least 80% of artists, writers, and performing artists contracted, provided exposure or assistance via Love Your Rebellion, self-identify as women, immigrants, people of color, people from queer and trans communities, people from low-income communities, and or people with disabilities. Love Your Rebellion's Zine Library is an ongoing example of Diversity First programming. Zines chosen for the library showcase varying identities, experiences, languages, and cultures. Library entrance is free in fact, all LYR programming is free or low cost in order to make arts experiences more accessible. Love Your Rebellion Zine Library falls in the 33905 zip code of Lee County. 35% of the residents are Hispanic and 65% of the residents are non-Hispanic or Latino. 37% of the residents are unemployed. There are so many more programs that LYR has developed using Diversity First. I encourage you to visit our website, loveyourrebellion.org or our social media pages at Love Your Rebellion to get a more in-depth look at the impact and the range of our multidisciplinary arts programming, developing programming from a diversity first approach lowers the barrier to access for opportunities in the arts and experiences in the arts, allowing Love Your Rebellion to empower artists, writers, and performing artists from marginalized groups. Once again, I'm Angela Page, the chair of the board of directors for Love Your Rebellion, and I just really wanna thank you for your time and consideration. Hi, I'm Angela Page, the founder and the chair of the board of directors of Love Your Rebellion, a 501c3 that empowers marginalized groups through the arts, including women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQIA communities, people from low-income communities, and people with disabilities by creating opportunities in the arts that employ, discover, and assist. Before I tell you more about Love Your Rebellion, let me tell you a little bit about my background and expertise. Prior to founding Love Your Rebellion, I spent nine years teaching English, creative writing, and sociology in higher education. I hold a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Creative Writing from the University of Central Florida and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative and Critical Writing from Goddard College with a specialization in feminist theory and poetry. I'm also a professional musician with experience in live performance and audio production. My studies and my time in the classroom showed me how different life can be based on things like race, gender, sexual orientation, orientation, ethnicity, ability, and class. But I learned those life experiences pretty early on. The distinct overlap of being the child of a gay Italian American parent really exemplified to me how inaccessible the world can be to someone who's part of one or more marginalized groups. The problems LYR seeks to solve are lack of opportunities in the arts and lack of accessible arts experiences for people from marginalized groups. The organization takes on this problem by creating programming through an approach we've coined called diversity first. So instead of creating programming and then figuring out how to make it diverse, LYR begins with diversity in mind, then we create programming from that perspective. Diversity First also maintains that at least 80% of artists, writers, and performing artists contracted, provided exposure or assistance via Love Your Rebellion, self-identify as women, immigrants, people of color, people from queer and trans communities, people from low-income communities, and or people with disabilities. Love Your Rebellion's Zine Library is an ongoing example of Diversity First programming. Zines chosen for the library showcase varying identities, experiences, languages, and cultures. Library entrance is free. In fact, all LYR programming is free or low cost in order to make arts experiences more accessible. 
Love Your Rebellion's Dean Library falls in the 33905 zip code of Lee County. 35% of the residents are Hispanic and 65% of the residents are non-Hispanic or Latino. 37% of the residents are unemployed. There are so many more programs that LYR has developed using Diversity First. I encourage you to visit our website, loveyourrebellion.org, or our social media pages at Love Your Rebellion to get a more in-depth look at the impact and the range of our multidisciplinary arts programming, developing programming for from a diversity first approach lowers the barrier to access for opportunities in the arts and experiences in the arts, allowing Love Your Rebellion to empower artists, writers, and performing artists from marginalized groups. Once again, I'm Angela Page, the chair of the board of directors for Love Your Rebellion, and I just really wanna thank you for your time and consideration. Hi, I'm Angela Page, the founder and the chair of the board of directors of Love Your Rebellion, a 501- And we've returned from break talked about how mage works we talked a lot about love your rebellion because they're awesome and we introduced our characters and now you can actually start figuring out your mission with a bunch of strangers at disneyland in the lightsaber store so uh the professor will speak up and say and the thing that i don't understand is i guess this this dvd just showed up at my private lab no way to trace who sent it to me and I feel extremely like a mouse about to enter a trap. I mean, I trust all of you, perhaps. I, I, I'd take a double look at uh, Keenan or uh, Kieran, sorry. Uh, and uh, then, uh, but why us? Why would they send it to us? This person obviously has access to the technocracy's internal documentation and videos, it seems. Is I will say, one, I thing say... I didn't, one thing I didn't add to your list of things is the Sphinx, if you want to research that. Go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the Sphinx. Seems to have brought us together for a reason. Is this where I haul out something pithy about mysterious ways? <laughs> it's all a answered. part of the great machine. I it would be more of an answer than we have right now. What do you think we should look into first? Is anyone familiar with this kind of investigation? I know a little bit about tracking people down. We've had to trace a couple of threats in our city, but I, I don't really even know where to begin looking. I mostly sling crystals and have opinions about books. Out of character, I will remind everyone, especially the newer people mostly, uh, you can do magical research, you can scry, you can do object reading. Try to look back in time. You can also do crazy nonsense with the internet because the internet is in mage is a magical realm that was created by Alan Turing, who was a mage. So, uh, storyteller, uh, I note that I have a rather large number of dots in a cult, and I'm curious. You do. If, I'm curious if uh, uh, maybe an intelligence plus a cult might might get me some recall about what the sphinx means in this context let's do it difficulty six okay so that's going to be a 60 10 whoops uh, R6, 10. and let's see here that's uh eight seven and ten is two for four successes perfect um A cult would have told you you actually have heard of the Wellsburg Tribunal. The Wellsburg Tribunal was where uh, the mages of the traditions and the technocracy, the only time they've ever joined forces, uh, 
pass judgment on a bunch of uh, Nefandi or uh, Moxie and uh, Lungile, that would be uh, super evil mages with or without devils. Like everything they do is vile and gross to cause pain and oblivion. Uh, in World War II, and that would be an occult role because everyone has heard the stories about the Nazi occult societies and how they actually could do things that were really, really bad and scary. They actually almost ended reality. Uh, that's what the Wellsburg trials were. But you've never heard of this one. Which is weird. It's like they kept some of them secret. It would also get you the Sphinx. Uh, you've probably heard other uh, hollow ones through your uh, various networks, club hangouts, book clubs. But the Sphinx has a thing that's been popping up in rumor. Just sending weird messages to tradition mages, sending them on missions no one knows about. Generally being spooky and untraceable. Uh, leaning heavily into what the Sphinx actually means. Mysteries and riddles by an ancient source of power that knows more than you do about what's going on. And there's a word been going, uh, passing around mage circles about this Sphinx. A rogue council. Ending transmissions. So it would seem that an alternate group of higher-ups has somehow taken an interest in us to clean up the remainder of some sort of old Nazi tribunal. I mean, we know they find an old Nazi officer here and there every couple of years. Suppose that's how we end up with what we've got here. Yeah, that was still happening in the 90s. Yeah, but but it doesn't make sense. Why why us? What is a singer and a professor and a wildlife aficionado and all of us coming together have to do with solving this? Uh, there are three things you could roll to try to get clues on that: enigmas, because that's mysteries; politics, because some of you are pretty important; or investigation, because that's the generic learn things skill. What were you going to say, Professor Gray? Uh. As he's positing that, I'll just um, use my prime to coalesce, like just a, a ball of like quintessence just floating in my hand. <laughs> just kind of create um, some tasks. Yeah, well, not like actual tasks, just like le just shape it floating above oh, okay. my hand and be like, because every one of us can do this if we need to. And then I'll just like flick it off into reality. Since we're floating in like 20 points of quintessence, I'll spend one to just put it in the <laughs> air, right? In in a in a flashy show. All it takes will that be intelligence? Uh it depends. Are you gonna use a sphere or are you gonna use brain power? If you can convince me of a sphere, I'd let you add that to it instead of intelligence if it's better. Um I don't know that I have a sphere. I okay. mean, I've got two dots of mind, but I've also got two dots of intelligence. Yeah, go ahead and roll it with intelligence then. Oh, that's a nothing. Okay. Uh, but not a botch, right? Just a failure? A four, a three, and a two. You think about it for a second and you're like I don't know I'm cool I don't know about the rest of you I mean obviously I'm here because this is where uh, the threads of destiny have led me to so why bother getting caught up on the details we are here because we're meant to be here I know my purpose Karen you could actually do some fortune telling as the uh, entropy mage if you wish. Yeah, why not? Uh, also, uh, Lungile could too if you want. Uh, Kieran can actually do let's read each other's threads of fate. Lungile could actually call up a spirit and be like, hey, do you know what's going on? Uh, since I have had the privilege of playing mage before, let's go ahead and let Lungile do it. Okay. Uh, so... 
first. Go ahead and roll me spirit, which this, you'll, I'll tell you what to do in a second. But for the audience, we're going to roll spirit plus enigmas, which means you would combine your enigmas dots with your spirit sphere dots, which should give you a pool of like eight dice. And then what you can do is in the chat box and roll 20, do this. Just copy paste that, and then I can hover over it and tell you your results for a custom roll. I should basically do what show us eight d tens and whether you succeed or fail. And then put that in the chat box and roll twenty. Yep, and then hit enter. Ooh, that's a good roll. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight successes. <laughs> Because the tens double, and the tens also remove that one. So, with eight successes, yes, you are able. Uh, we'll put your call up. So, are you looking more for why you or for information on what's happening before I tell you what you summoned? what's happening okay you're able to call up an old spirit a spirit from san francisco a spirit that's been here for a long time and would definitely still be potent enough to remember those days in san francisco specifically there's still there was a lot of energy from world war ii for both good and very negative reasons because of internment camps for japanese americans it is easy to find such spirits in this town that would be willing to talk. So uh, it's not the spirit of a person. That would actually be entropy. This would be like a land spirit or a nature spirit or something from the area. A genius loci. Watches. A genius loci, yes. It is old enough to have remembered what it was like here in the 40s. Uh, and with eight successes... So. The spirit is able to tell you about Situation 6. Because in mage society at the time, it was like Captain America and his World War II Avengers. Two mages. So it actually plays for you like a newsreel. Like a newsy reel from a 40s movie theater before the movie ran, viewing Bond's propaganda. And you can all experience this. But it shows several pitched battles between Situation 6 and Axe's mages. Uh... And these newsreels, you can actually tell, seem to be authentic, Professor Gray. Uh, you can tell that because this is the way Etherites filmed newsreels in the 40s. There's a specific thing to it that is different than a regular. Yeah, it's got, it's got, it's got that Ether capture device mm -hmm. version two uh, uh, film grain, right? Yep. So the spirit is replaying actual newsreels Etherites captured of situation six from the period for you from its memory uh these were to improve allied traditionalist morale at the beginning of the war when the technocracy was still with the axis and then they kept up the practice even after the technocracy realized the axis had an affinity in them starting in 1942 they fought alongside the french and spanish resistance on d-day uh, they joined several mages who landed on the beaches and over the next year, they cut a swath from France all the way to Berlin, where in May 6 of 45, they kill several Nefandi in the ruins of the Reichstag. On June 11th, they capture Alois Richter and three other mages, the same ones who were later spirited away from history, because no one knows what happened to Alois Richter's uh, compatriots. Alois Richter, for those who don't know, in mage history was the mastermind of the most evil mages of the time. Uh, for a time, the mages thought they had ejected all of the super evil wizards from the planet because they caught him and his lackeys. They were wrong. Uh, during the fight, Situation 6 mage Jane Powell attempts to call a fire elemental to her side, but collapses screaming. You all recognize this is similar to the Avatar Storm and what happens when you touch it when you're trying to reach through it. There was no Avatar Storm in 1945. Uh... Joan, go ahead and roll your air take. 
my Erite? My Erite is five. Oh, that's a seven and a ten. Nice. Okay, three successes tells you Dachau has storm tainted residents in 1945. That does not make sense. There was no Avatar Storm then. There was no Maelstrom then. In the underworld. But you can sense storm tainted residents around Dachau. And that's what just happened to that soldier. Interestingly, Dr. Mondial, the sixth member of Situation 6, doesn't always appear in these visions or arrives out of nowhere to save the rest of them from certain death like a movie. Always dressed in dark ether goggles, an aviator's helmet, a trench coat, and a long spotless blue scarf, he seems to regard nine men as his apprentice, this person that seems to be the center of all the videos you were, of the video you were all sent. Uh... Also, the ga the uh, genius loci tells you nine men is here in this city. It can sense him still. Uh, and with eight successes, I won't even make you do another investigation roll. He's staying at a cheap motor lodge in the Burbs, but frequently drives downtown to take in the city. Registered under the name Benedict. A Benedict. And then the spirit fades. The amount of time you can hold it here in potential reality is limited because of the Avatar Storm. Simply talking to you hurts it in the long run. Uh, I think it, as I've learned to do, though I don't really understand why. So okay. what's the likelihood <laughs> of uh, time travel being involved in this? That was my question, too. Uh... Anyone with at least one dot in time did not sense any time resonance in those flashbacks. That doesn't mean it's not involved, but it wasn't involved with Dr. Mondial. However, there is heavy correspondence resonance. What would a heavy correspondence resonance indicate? Teleportation. Knowing exactly when to be there and teleporting there to save the day. Okay. Still sus, but a different kind of sus. I figure he's watching through the the film reels, right? That that's that's my that's my theory at least. If anyone right, yeah. if anyone if anyone has the sus look, I'm like he's sitting in a lab and watching in the film reel. Like that's the safest place to be. And then it, when you can just step, you've got the teleportation machine right next to you. You can be anywhere you need to be. It makes more sense to be as many places as you can. I point out the windows of the store as if they were computer monitors into, into different points in time. Um, and actually, uh, while I do that, can I make one of them be a computer monitor to, like, the guy's house? You can. With a correspondence, too? Yeah. Simple Arate roll, difficulty four. One success is all you need. Yep, you're good. Now, while they do that, and while Moxie's holding the time, the other four of you, well, actually, Lungile is thanking and sending off Spirit in the proper fashion. Uh, <laughs> the other three of you, knowing as much as you do now about Nine Man and uh, the flashbacks and the Wellsburg Tribunal, you could attempt to figure out this Operation Spark Maker thing with a combination of time, prime, and either correspondence or uh, entropy. I have four prime and two correspondence. Got that entropy. Yep, Kieran's got four entropy. What about jealousy? Well, I've got the time, but I've got a dot in time. Um, you have correspondence? I also have correspondence. Yes, between the three of you, you could make that happen with a ritual roll. The thing you immediately notice when you try to focus in on that specific trial at the tribunal, because now you have a sympathetic connection to the uh, Situation 6 and to the tribunal, 
and to this area where one of the situation six is, you're able to hone in with magical senses on that particular trial, but it's warded. It's warded against time and correspondence, and it will require a ritual roll where all three of you roll together. Should we roll our arrow day? You do. You have the sympathetic connection, so you are able to roll Arate with correspondence time and entropy to look into the past, but you have to overcome the wards. You will need 12 successes between the three of you with no botches to succeed. This includes me, right? Uh, no, you're holding up the time effect. Okay. I'm just going to put the description as teamwork. Yeah. All right. I'm going to spend one of my copious quintessence. Yes. That's wise for all of you because the DC starts at eight. If you don't spend, you can spend. You can spend up to three, right? Yep. Yes. Yeah. I will spend three. Thank What's you. What's the What is the base difficulty before we get started here? Eight. So three quintessence eight. brings you to five. I will be doing that. I will also be doing that. Okay. Oh, no. Wait. That. Uh, and additional to that, I am going to spend a point of willpower. Yes. Okay. For uh, Moxie and Mundial, willpower is the bottom of your sheet. Every time you check the box, not the dot, but the box below it, you get one automatic success on the roll you spend it on. If your willpower hits zero, you collapse from fatigue. <laughs> willpower is restored in various ways. It doesn't really matter in one shot. So... I rolled a seven and an eight okay. and two ones. Oh no, got nothing. <laughs> okay. Uh, four successes. Aaron got four, so that just leaves jealousy. Four, Thanks. eight, nice. So uh, we can, of course, extend the roll, right? You can. Now, what's going to happen is every extension puts extreme pressure on the time stop. So, Moxie, please mark one paradox, which you do on your wheel at the other end of the wheel by clicking twice, and it will make a different weird symbol. And the pitchfork, it'll be... It is. I think it's an X. An X, yeah. As reality starts to crush you with forcing you to release the time stop. So just one for now. They only need two. They only need four more successes. All three of you combined to do it in two tries, which is two hours in this case. Each and roll is a time increment. Could be seconds. Could be hours. Could be days. Depends on the magic. And I right. will. I will oh. uh, again spend three quintessence. Okay. Fine. Karen, you're gonna blow the quintessence too. I don't know. That's a lot of paradox. <laughs> no, quintessence is actually reducing the chance of more paradox. Um, if I know that it's taking them longer to unlock this, uh, I'll I'll channel some quintessence into the spell form. They're actually okay, mm-hmm. but we still need to see Kieran roll because Kieran could remove successes from the group roll. <laughs> right, true. <laughs> uh, I rolled three successes. Did and Jealousy got four and Kieran got two. For a total of nine. Um, Except I pre-rolled. Oh. Kieran, remove four paradox, and your successes drop. Oh, thank fuck. To five. Oh, wait, what? However, God. you only needed four, so you're still okay. I that think this is your punishment. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of paradox oh. backlash hit you there. You said yeah. how wait, many so paradox? You lose four, so you're down okay. to six. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't enough to stop the spell. There was enough for the note hanging in the air to start being discordant and start to sound like it's been uh, set called. And they uh, fake tune, uh, auto tuned, and it disrupts your concentration. So, but it doesn't break the spell. But everyone knows it came from Kira. Who turned on the auto tune? I believe so, that was uh, you. So, what are we at in aggregate here? You succeeded by more than one. So you got oh. what you needed plus one. Oh, well, I haven't even rolled yet, so I don't need to roll then. And I can Correct. Put the, You're okay. I can put the quintessence I was going to spend back in. Go team. Okay. Breaking through the wards. You see three men and one woman under heavy guard in a rail car first, and then a boat. One of them is Alois Richter. The, we- the rest 
you don't know who they are, but reading what's happening, you're able to tell at the time they were known awakened Nazi collaborators from the Order of Hermes, Iteration X, and the Verbena. You were always Nazi told. Nazi Verbena? Yeah, you were always told that that wasn't what happened because, you know, oh. history is written by the victors. Uh, Sparkmaker was a top secret, obviously, it was super warded. Operation. Who has allies or contacts? His background. I do not. I don't. I don't know if I gave that to anyone, but uh, Moxie and what was, what was the background? And Kieran. Allies or contacts, either one. Uh, that would be me. Which one? Two of each. Okay, kill one of each Ooh. to represent being used for the session. Because you actually have to make mundane calls to uh, your friends to help with this. Uh, and it tells you something very strange because the contact and the ally you used are people whose names you don't share that play both sides. Well, people snap. who know what's going on in the technocracy to some extent. Right, right. I know I'm lo putting you uh, a bit out, but... Uh... I need to know about this information. Uh, right. Right. You learn that uh, that was a technocracy train and a technocracy boat. Those were members of the Thule Society that the technocracy took and disappeared with and tried to remove from history. What is it that America did after World War II? The Operation Paperclip? Yes. Paperclip, yeah. This seems like a technocracy equivalent. Maybe this is why you're being given all this weird nonsense. I wonder what Nine Men knows. Nine Men knows. Because what if, you know, those Nazi scientists are still around doing something real bad? Burn it with fire. Yes. They're not making moon shuttles, that's for sure. These, uh... Scientists might still be around. Yeah, and he'll did explain I, uh, everything from the call. Huh. If they are, that's very disturbing. They've had... 40 years to dream up something. I wonder. Dream or nightmare? I suppose that's a matter of perspective. I know what I'm here for now. Uh, did I get anything from uh, trying to peek in on the address that we got for uh what are your spheres again that you have any dots in correspondence to prime two forces three time two matter four uh how much in mind none two none okay but i do have prime so i'm hoping an old mage has a resonance of some sort. You get nothing at all for the entire three hours all the rest of this is happening until the last five minutes. When you're just looking at an empty apartment and you can't read any energy in there, except, you know, uh, the sense of an awakened person having been in there recently. That's all you're really mm -hmm. getting. When it goes from nothing to suddenly the guy is right there looking directly at you. Uh, hello. We were looking for you. Do you mind if we stop by? Uh, yes, I do. Maybe I'll come see you. Who the fuck are you again? I can't do it, but he has a transatlantic accent.
My name's Professor Gray. Mm -hmm. Looks you up and down, arches an eyebrow. You remind me of somebody I don't like. Why are you scrying me? Better tell me quick before I turn the arcane back on. You'll never see me again. Uh, we were, I believe we were, uh, a small group of us was delivered what apparently is your, uh, short biography. Would you like to see it? I have it on DVD. I could bring it over. I'll come to you. And then he's just not there anymore. I think he might be on his way. You have enough magic sense to understand this is a very high level of arcane. Why you didn't get anything for the first three hours. Mm -hmm. On his way to where, though? Are you just going to hang out here at the lightsaber shop or what? It is approaching uh, end of day. It's, I will also mention that, that I believe he could find us wherever we went if we wish to go someplace less uh, vulgar to maintain. I know a spot. Where do you take him? Um, you know, I I make a quick phone call or two within the tradition and find the finest punk squat you've ever seen. Glorious, Moxie. The mattresses on the floor are clean. If this, is this a place full of people? Not, not currently. Okay. Moxie, you do not need the super disguise. Okay. You arrive. You have a dinner of uh, something San Franciscan. And uh, well, I've been to California, but not there. What, what do we got, Rachel? Uh, Disneyland and San Francisco are a seven hour drive apart. We got correspondence for that. <laughs> Anything good at Disney? You have a very cheap dinner of cheap food. <laughs> it's Chinese takeout. Uh, so what we could do is uh, use correspondence to set up a connection between Disneyland and the Walt Disney Biographical Museum, which is in San Francisco. Okay. What's there? The uh, Walt Disney, it's um, it's just like a museum dedicated to him and his life, so probably a lot of artifacts, like sketches that he made, and stuff Mickey's he first pair of underwear. Yeah. Uh, so you find a place to hole up that's relatively left alone by the mundane. You get something to eat. And you get just enough time to get very bored when a uh, gentleman just shows up. One second he's there, not there, and the next he is. But he's actually taking something off and appears as he removes it. It's like a uh, shimmery fabric, space age sci-fi. Uh, like a uh, kind of blanket they give you when you're suffering from hypothermia. That's what it reminds you of. As he pulls it off, he folds it up until it's about that big and he sticks it in his pocket. Uh, he looks at all of you and uh, he's dressed in a suit that is definitely out of fashion not 40s out of fashion but like 80s 70s out of fashion except for the fact that his shoes are new and they're good running shoes and that uh, all of his pockets are full of tech cutting edge 90s tech you know like a Blackbeard and a Palm Pilot <laughs> And a really big, chunky cell phone. And it occurs to you, this isn't a tradition, mage. The situation six for technocrats. He is, oh, of course you're deviants. You, you must be the one I saw. He looks directly at Professor Gray. I'll pull out my firearm. I press play on the DVD player. He watches the whole thing. 
You have a leak in your organization, sir. Clearly. But it seems you were trying to do the right thing then. I point at the screen. We always try to do the right thing. It's your kind who make this world a worse place. You're the dangerous one. Yeah, I'm not the one dressed like I'm going to a Talking Heads concert right now. <laughs> Why do you care? It's just a bunch of old World War II footage. That was a long time ago. Why now? I don't know. You read your misdirect you, we could burn resources. We could put a bunch of your most powerful people in one place at one time so we could nuke you. How do you know that's not what's about to happen? We've done it before. I, uh... Bro, I'll you try know, to... I got six hit marks out there. Uh, and, uh, my gun. Hit marks are cyborgs. Yeah. Um... Sorry. I, I kind of blanked out here. Does anyone else have a witty <laughs> response? Oh, no. Um, just, you know, nonverbal talking. About yeah, it. yeah. Uh, I, uh, I think I'm just cultivating an air of moral superiority. Wasn't this has got anything to say? Not even you, pop star. I'm just waiting for the right moment, don't you know? I loved Black Roses. It's my favorite single. Yeah, everybody loves Black Roses. That's the point. So, if you guys are just trying to get us together to get rid of us, why would you pull together the most powerful knowing that we'd probably be able to just do away with whatever you're trying to do? He waits to see if any of the other three of you have anything to say. Kieran or uh, Long Isle or Jealousy. Making a transmission from the Rogue Council would be a rather indirect way to rid the world of six mages in one squat. Uh, you can see he visibly lets his guard down somewhat and says, all right, you're just as clueless as me. There's no hit marks out there. He closes the door behind him. He says, Look, <laughs> they're after me just like they're after you. I'm only here because courage tipped me off. That they were coming for me. The uh, courage? Yes. What's he like? Yeah, weird, right? I can't remember. Can't even remember if it was a he. Uh, again, for... Moxie and Long Isle, John Courage is like a super famous technocrat turned traditionalist, like uh, the Iron Man of Mage Society. <laughs> but no one, but he doesn't announce to the world that he's Iron Man. That's more like Spider Man. Uh, everyone but me from Situation Six is dead or incapacitated. I'm sure I was due for either termination or uh, uh, Room Zero, but I got tipped off, so I got out. Who was coming after you? The Black Hats. Who else? The Beer Shades. I don't know why. I don't know what we did. We only ever followed orders. Oh, well, that's a phrase let's... that gets used a lot. Let's start there. What were your orders? I've been retired for nine years. Look at me. You look at him, he looks like he's 50. I'm 80 fucking years old. I was young in 1945, but not that young. In the nine years, and then a decade before I was retired, I was pushing papers at Construct in Philly. I don't know why suddenly after 19 years they want to kill me. But obviously, you have some kind of clue. Must have something to do with all of this. Uh, what is he indicating when he says this? He waves his hand towards the DVD that's currently self-destructing. Mm. 
Well, it seems as though destiny has brought us together for a reason, despite our myriad differences. Uh, you can tell he's holding something back. Give me a couple, as in two of you, social roles, see if you can sway him to open up to you. You intimidation. You could try, but that'll be a higher difficulty than charisma. Yeah, uh, I've got a pretty good charisma and a pretty good empathy. Same. So, so let's have Joan and Moxie roll. Uh, empathy or expression plus charisma. Whatever's better for either of you. You're figuring him out or using flowery words to sway him. Difficulty six. Which one am I rolling? Sorry. Uh, for you, expression plus charisma. Oh, that is... Five. Nice. Yeah. I'm getting there. Six, that's ten. Um, what is it? What's the number? Uh, eight dice. It'll be expression plus charisma for you. Eight. Submit. Difficulty... Six. Two. That's a total of eight successes, which is more than enough to critically succeed. You know, confession uh, is good for the soul. <laughs> Joan tries to convince him that he should unburden himself. Moxie offers uh, uh, autographs. I don't know. What would Moxie use to sway him? Um, I'll, 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 um, I'll write him a song. Oh, okay. Mm. He's a fan. Uh, after sitting down and talking to the guy for like 30 minutes, you manage to get out of him. He has actually lost his faith in the technocracy. Because they refuse to let justice override self-interest, and that's a problem for him. It's making it, it has made him feel guilty by association for two decades. He tells you, yeah, he was there. And he remembers helping capture the Thule Society mages at Dakaw. And he remembers that there was something there called the Torture Fountain that had an effect similar to the Avatar Storm. That can't be great. I mean, I don't think uh, anything called the Torture Fountain is wholesome. <laughs> On his Palm Pilot, he actually has a bunch of, of stuff course. he's kept. I say, of course they called it the Torture Fountain. Of course, yes. Uh, on his Palm Pilot, he has a bunch of information he has saved over time. He shows it to all of you as a group. There are, there are copies of the medical records of 13 of the 14 awakened subjects of Richter's experiments. Uh... Recordings are marked CFS Vigilant Isolation Center Eyes Only. There are 13 autopsy photos that show a collection of people who all appear to have died in intense pain while having their bodies twisted into inhuman forms by magic. Some have what appear to be bloody wings dangling from their shoulders. shoulders. Others have huge luminous eyes and rubbery gray-green skin. Each subject either died from physical trauma or was killed due to brain death or a dangerous parapsychological reaction to xenogenetic implantation, according to the medical records. Oh my god. Is this freaking xenomorphs? No. I mean, it is uh, good tired, guess with me, though. so that's a fair question. Yes. But not this time. Uh, it's worse. He says he knows where CFS Vigilant is. And that it's a military base and technocracy outpost in the Arctic. That's all he knows, because it's top secret. Uh, and that's when you understand something that didn't kick in right away when you were looking at those medical records and autopsy photos. Those weren't from 1945. Those were from maybe the 70s or 80s. Also, there were 14 subjects, but only 13 records. 
So whatever base they set up there might still be going on. And those are specifically autopsy after action reports, which implies what about the missing 14th person? Still alive. Still alive. Still in the duty. experiment and, worked on and, somebody. And probably killed the other 13th. <laughs> Nine Men says he won't go with you, but he urges you to go and figure this out. Obviously, Danger and his friends, who he assumes sent you the stuff, want you to deal with this. He's lost faith in the technocracy, but he's not quite a defector, so he's not James bonding any Arctic nonsense with you. The Arctic's an awfully large place. I'm not well, going to get very far hiking around. He has coordinates. Well, that's like, okay. yeah. He also tells you that uh, it's called CFS Vigilant, which actually a quick internet search from uh, Professor Gray. You know, the rest of you are like, how do you search the internet? It's just message boards. Uh, <laughs> tells you that CFS means Canadian Forces Station Vigilant. It's probably a signals base is what it originally was. It should like, be pretty know, easy to track down, base, even though it yeah. is, even though it is uh, probably also warded. Uh, it, it will be the only thing warded in the entirety of the Arctic, probably. Not just kidding. Um, yeah, no, if we have the coordinates, I guess the thing I'm trying to figure out is here's are the any of us like before you uh, follow that thought through? Here's the problem Canadian Forces Station Vigilant is still an active distant early warning line station that alerts NORAD in the event of nuclear strikes, meaning there are legit sleeper soldiers in the military, station, yeah, not technocrats. Well, I mean, they don't know it, but they are technocrats. Uh, I hate to hate to break it to them. Uh, so we'd be walking into a facility that we really have no right to be in. I've gone lots of places that I have no right to be in. Wait. You got an idea how to get the six of us into this place? And I pull up like an obscure photo taken in the 70s of this base. And it's like a cave entrance, probably. Oh, sure. The complication being there probably is a construct there. That's what you call a technocracy base. Yeah. Underneath. And this military guys probably don't know anything about it. You're going to storm in there and kill a bunch of military kids? To get your objective, what's your plan here? There's a bit of luck. There's a bit of correspondence. There's a bit of mind's time. You know. Good recipe. Quick research with those things tells you there's probably 50 active soldiers there. That's a lot. It's a NORAD station. It's heavily protected. This is still the 90s. Communism has only fallen for a few years now. Or is Yeltsin a, still in power? Got a siren that might be able to sing people to sleep. Uh, I'm sure this nun over here can lead them in prayer, make them feel bad for what they're doing. Don't make people feel bad. <laughs> Our uh, spirit talker over here probably call on a bit of ghosts plenty of people have died down there right we're not we're not I, I just like shake my head we're not even gonna make it through the front door with that strategy oh well please I mean, tell me of your ideas are we seriously considering this we want to believe that he doesn't know the the place that we need to get to and how to get in there he tells us he knows some stuff and he doesn't know some details but then he has really clear details on other things I feel like we're walking into a trap if we don't think that's out. Take him as our hostage? What if 
we told them the truth. We're independent contractors sent here by a higher power here to fix a problem in the basement. Here it worked for Moses. Definitely not, Celestial Chorus. I'm not exactly a man of faith. Oh, that's all right. I'll believe enough for both of us. Sweet. And you can believe that bullets will be deflected right around us without any use of arate or anything. What is arate except the divine making itself manifest in all of us? Saints preserve us. Precisely. Uh, Professor Gray, you're able to actually get that image I just sent in the Zoom. You would be able to get that with public record in the late 90s for an installation like that. Ooh, can I use my... Oh man, it has a runway. That that just totally changes that. <laughs> Alright. So, did he give us access um, to, like, blueprints of this place? Is that... No. Okay. Professor Gray found a basic rundown that you see in the Zoom with an internet internet search. Oh, okay. Nothing to do I with thought... The technocrat. There's, like, a okay. runway, a couple of barracks, uh, and then, like, some hatches into a... I guess there's a subterranean area over there would be my guess but this is all we get to see basically an aerial image that's got markings on it because professor gray put markings on it for you including at that particular snapshot where the guards were if that ends up mattering um so could i burn the rest of my allies and contacts to get some internal layout or even you know some just some juicy information that we don't already have. Uh, no, because it's a, well, of the base, sure, but not of whatever's underneath. What? Okay, so what if we cut power to the base? Like, cut their electricity? Just... At that, would probably take out any of their security systems and preoccupy them so they're busy trying to get the lights back on and we just sneak past the chaos. If you haven't noticed, I am the chaos. I could touch their warriors. Sounds like the best plan I've heard yet. Um, I'm sitting and thinking about the little invisibility cloak trick that uh, the dude just pulled on us. Yes, he has um, cloaking four, and that's how it manifests for him. Uh, or in your case, arcane. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, I uh, I have forces three, matter four, and mm -hmm. prime two, and I'm wondering if I could temporarily enchant our outer clothing to to give a similar light bending effect yes you can it won't help with mind but yes it will make you physically invisible you just have to deal with the soul and the mind that's one step towards pure invisibility though can we... being as a team you can probably cover all of it can i now that will be enough for the mundane soldiers unless you make noise which you can also make yourselves... Well, forces could deal with, yeah, the noise as well. They'd be like, sound and light bending. But that wouldn't stop the technocracy from knowing you were coming. It, I, I, I will say, I've used this strategy of the past. It gets extremely confusing to know where your friends even are. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so we have to, like, hold promise to hold hands while we're wearing these things. I'm <laughs> like, not holding your school. hand. <laughs> Uh, Lungile was saying something, I believe. No, I was wondering if my stealth could help in survival and pairing up with Professor Gray. 
Yes, you're very sneaky because you have some arcane too, I think. Which adds to your stealth. But that only helps you. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. However, you can use four dots of spirit to cloak everyone's spirits. I mean, Wait. the only way they'd be visible then would be their souls. How many dots of arcane do you have? Two. So very many. I mean, so with arcane, it means that people forget you uh, after they meet you. Uh, it's really useful. So no. you could. That's not. Uh, me, sorry. It's someone uh, else. Well, the person with arcane could, like, will put you in uniform. And you'd be like, hello, the independent contractors are here to fix the problem. And then they're like, uh, yes, sir, right this way, sir. And then they forget about you. It's true for whoever has at least two dots in arcane. Not three. Just, a. Uh... Don't forget me. All right, if we're not holding hands, can we at least tie a rope around our waists? Fine. So, let's have that Arate I mean, roll from Professor I mean, with, a, with a body, with a little bit of a body sample from each of you, I'd always know where you are. I've got the correspondence to cover that. True. Just I'll hair. trust you with a lock hair. of my hair. I'm not quite certain of that. You know how much a lock of my hair costs. <laughs> you don't need a lock of hair. <laughs> you could get out a nail file and give me a little bit of nail powder. I mean, fingernail, yeah. eyelash, whatever. I guess it's. I guess it's worth it. Maybe it's Maybelline. The gray can make an Arate roll. Joan can make an Arate roll, and uh, Lungao can make an Arate roll to attempt to cloak. And I also have correspondence too, so technically I could make us aware of each other and then maybe somehow I don't know do you have minds? no that yeah no and I doubt any uh... although your practice might be close enough to weird science to <laughs> go to magic commingle yeah I was going to say to commingle with uh, mind if you have it that we could like I don't just have, have a sense of where each other are. But. I don't have minds. I have mine. I have two mind. Uh oh, nice. What's your practice? <laughs> Shamanism. Yeah. That's. I mean, I could, I could probably work something out. I mean, it could just be a separate spell too that gives us that awareness. It doesn't have to be in the in the cloaking effect. Oh my god, I just had I'll an just idea. Do All right. I don't know if it'll work. This is Ambrose, not the character. Chaos magic. Twizzlers. Twizzler ropes. Peel it off, break off pieces, and each person has a piece of the rope. I mean, Word. that's not the worst idea I've heard. Also, thanks for the donations, Nautilus and Geek Genesis. Uh, Geek Genesis is awarding you Bonus dice or quintessence because of jealousy. Oh. Each Genesis is an old friend of mine from my much younger years, and thank you so much. Um. So, what did you want for my Arate roll? Oh, just a straight Arate roll. Difficulty five for each of you for Gray, Joan, and Longile. This will uh, tell us whether you're able to cloak. What's the lowest I can make that with? Three is the seat, is the floor. Yeah, yeah. That's Ooh. Uh, a five, an eight, and a ten. Yes, then you're willpower. easily able to. However, I want to know your fluff. How do you cloak soul? 
How do you make Lots. your dot look awakened? Uh, for, uh, Tyler, for Erte, value. Value. Uh, DP value is for, like, dice bonus. Oh, zero. And then for the second question, five. So what you're and gonna I say, Joan? I spent a willpower as well. Uh, Joan wafts a uh, very nice smelling incense over everybody from a sensor, and then over each person will strike a tuning fork to adjust uh, your spiritual resonance. Okay. And Lungile, how would you describe cloaking a spirit so you don't look supernatural? You just look like people. Uh, cloaking a spirit will use an ancient uh, practice that uh, focuses on biomimicry, like um, like the chameleon. And so, as individuals walk, the their uh, reflection reflects the actual view that individuals see them as. I like it. That's good shit. And Gray, what's your weird device to actually make you invisible? To the light. Uh, so I'm gonna end up mixing a couple of chemicals together in the lab to come up with a, basically a spray bottle treatment that we <laughs> put on our outer layer of clothing uh, that creates a, like a correspondence forces effect that basically projects the light from through you through you. So you're just kind of invisible and then it also has um, sound dampening so like you don't you make a little less noise. It wouldn't like stop us from yelling, but we would have to be close and probably talk at a normal volume rather than whisper. Okay. So then you are set now where- I got uh, five successes on that. Okay. I can okay, solve all that. Yep. Okay. Uh, So the way you're set for now is Kieran leads the way to get you inside, and then you all apply the actual invisibility spray once you're inside, except Kieran, who doesn't need to unless he chooses to. And you're gonna wander the base. That's where you're at so far. Which means mundane disguises are uh, the last thing you really need. What are you actually gonna go in as that needs to be fixed in the basement of a military base? Um, I think we like, need the world's most generic coveralls. Yeah. Yeah. What about credentials? Clean. I need paper. Who's I got mean, the mind for that? I've got two dots of mind. I don't think anybody's got higher. Does anybody have higher than two? I've got allies and contacts. I could get us to make stuff, maybe. I've got oh, an intelligence and streetwise pool. So, let's get Kieran to burn the last of your allies and contacts, since you can't use them again in one shot. Let's get Jealousy to roll uh, Streetwise and Wits. And let's see Moxie or, and Joan both roll uh, Arate. I don't know what skill I'd want that to be. Streetwise if you have it. Etiquette if you don't. You don't have either of those politics or bureaucracy. Law, sorry. Politics or law. I have etiquette. Works. Uh, what difficulty did you want that at? Six for everybody. Six for everybody. Uh, one, two, three, four, five successes. Okay, critical success. The DP is six, you said? Uh, no DP. The difficulty, though, is six, yeah. No. Oh, no! That's a botch! <laughs> no. So, uh, you know, wait, the three no, successes. It's, it's doing the math wrong? Oh, huh. did it? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, cause... A, that's an Arate roll. Yeah, mousing over, it's a three, a five, an eight, and two ones. So right. there are successes in there. It's just the the sheet doesn't calculate successes the way you do. The one, yeah, that would still be a botch 
And that wouldn't be and that would be a botch because the first one kills the eight and the second one makes it. No, you're right. You got some successes at all, no botch. Yeah, there were some successes. My brain is failing me. Uh, but that was just Arate. You also could have added your uh, how many dice do you have in etiquette? Also willpower? Question mark. Oh yeah, I can use willpower too. How many etiquette dice do you have? Four. Uh, put that in the chat. That'll Three. roll the rest of the dice. Three. 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 Sorry. Oh, okay. Change that to slash r space 3d8. Or 3d10. I put an eight in there. Oh, uh, it needs coffee. This well, one. that was a copy paste. There we go. Doing it. So now that's a normal failure. So if you spend willpower, you get one success. Okay, let's do it. Okay, and then I just need to roll from uh, Joan. Oh yeah. So oh my God! I like... rolled three tens. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Which actually means, with my rules, that's two, four, six, seven successes. Okay. It's 13 total. That's definitely enough. So, you are able to gain access to the base. Uh, the surface buildings are... Well, actually, I do want to know one other thing. How do you get here? Some of you have a lot of money. You could just say you charter a jet, but if you have a fun, clever idea, I'll hear it. I was just assuming that was taken care of when Kieran blew the last of the contacts. Can we go to the penguin exhibit at the Monterey Aquarium and then use correspondence to just port to Antarctica? I would allow that for one paradox each. <laughs> but we're not trying to get to Antarctica, are we? The Arctic, Arctic, I thought. Then Moxie wouldn't have to blow any money. Moxie has like four resources. Uh, puff an exhibit then. <laughs> All right, take the one paradox each. I'm for it. <laughs> Wait, do we get to? Oh, I'll just step into the oh. penguin exhibit and step out onto that peninsula in the Arctic. Puff it. And I get like okay. a 50-50 chance that the professor thought ahead and made the spray bottle also keep you warm. Sure, roll it. <laughs> just like a... I just thought about that. How are we going to stay warm? Nope. We're not warm. We're all freezing. Uh, no, I'll say you were smart enough to wear proper jackets and boots and gloves. Right, cool. It looked at us Short. really weird at the... Monterey Aquarium, but you know. Yeah. We walked in there ready for the the aquatic or the uh, Arctic exhibit. We're just really big puffin enthusiasts. <laughs> so the surface buildings are unimpressive. They're made of prefabricated modules, square, sturdy things, corrugated metal, plastic siding. Uh, really thick supporting walls instead of foundations because the Arctic. Uh, nothing special about the administrative buildings, the barracks. The hangar doubles as the motor pool. There's no planes here when you arrive. They assume you took one of the snow cats. There are a lot of them here. There is a 40 foot tall air traffic control tower. Uh, however, the listening post, you all pick up on that with your various mage sites. It's a geodesic dome with a single large room and seems to be the source of any magical resonance you feel in this area. If you blow it up, you know, that'll probably alert them to your presence. You can try to hack it. I am not the computer person. 
I would just sing to it and hope for the best. So I don't think that plan would work very well. Um, so there's there's a security system in place stopping us from getting inside of it. No. Uh, you can get inside. What you see inside is a large single room filled with computers linked to antennas that go up to the roof. There's eight signal intelligence officers at all times in here. Uh, the room is very noisy because it has uh, the generator for the building and there's also an unoccupied high-tech workstation constantly emitting a weird high-pitched whine. And there's a black box plugged into that computer. The really weird port it's unmarked except for a small socket labeled biogel oxygenated neurostatic formula. And it's warm to the touch. Ew. I don't think body, I would touch body it. Body temperature warm. I don't know that it's warm to the touch. I didn't touch it. <laughs> I'm forgetting that. Um, uh, how much mind do you have, Professor Gray? I have zero. Okay. And does any and the rest of you go in with them? Only particular building. If my three dots and computer will help. Yes, it would. Okay. You have any mind? I don't think so. Let me double check that though. Uh, if oh, I do. Will help. Oh, okay. I got two dots. I don't know if that's enough to help with that. Yeah, that's a brain in the computer. Like a human brain? Yeah, this is definitely some technocracy in this building. <laughs> that is not consensual technology. Are you mother of God? Can we that's unplug that's why it? It's body temperature warm. You can that's hack disgusting. it. You can plug into it with the biogel port. All right. <laughs> How much Fine. computer does Gray have? Push in the brain. All right. So Gray, I actually do have two points of computer, but like I might recognize it if you mentioned four. I was gonna say I might recognize the the tech. Then, like when you mentioned there's a mind in there, I'll be like, oh, is that like a vintage brain case? And then I yes. start looking around. <laughs> okay. Kieran's just gonna so. give you the side eye. <laughs> We will need computer plus intelligence from Karen, and we'll need uh, technology plus wit or intelligence from Gray. Okay. Difficulty is nine. I'm gonna You're use trying to hack a brain. Willpower. Yep, yeah, seems wise. I'm just gonna do a roll with that because I don't think I can click those. I'm trying to figure out which of the windows I hit. Oh, there we go. Nine and nine, a five, a three, and an eight. That's two successes plus willpower is three. Sweet. And yeah, uh, I'll I'll use a willpower as well. But I guess that's two. All right, total of five. It's perfect success. Uh, no secondary rolls needed, which would have mattered because in order to be in here, Professor Gray has had to apply spray. Kieran does not because of this, the arcane. Bloody. It is safe for the rest of you to apply your spray and enter. The spray will last for a total of ten turns before you're visible. You've used one. Okay. When you manage to hack the system, it calls an elevator. You all get on the elevator and it takes you 50 feet down. Not that far in the modern world, but really deep in the Arctic substrata. And I'm like visibly shaking my head side to side, just like constantly noping the experience to myself. Just like, nope. <laughs> not not going to die to a random alien invader biomechanical monster created by the Iteration X today. That was not that was not my plan. That's not how we're gonna go. <laughs> uh, the construct that the doors open onto is a compact austere place. 
What's the scientific fortress you all expect is the stereotype for the technocracy? Uh, you notice as you walk into the hallway that the walls do this weird wavy thing. You know, like in sci-fi movies where little tiny boxes push it in and out like and then it can move like it's water. It does that. And like you're pretty sure when you all stepped off the elevator, the hallway expanded in size. You know, to fit your group. As if the layout of this base is programmable. And as if hmm. they know we're here. That's disturbing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh I'll reach into my backpack and pull out the owl. Okay. Who? Yes, the whole building is resonant. Um. This little wonder that there, little wonder that reads uh, quintessence and paradox. So, what so they, what it, yeah, what I was gonna say I'm gonna try to use it as like like just kind of like pop it up in front of us because it emits like a little map of the nearby area and like yep. spots that are high in paradox or quintessence um so like obviously we're a beacon on it uh you can see each one of us probably pretty clearly <laughs> but i'm looking for anyone else on it it it's probably just owl and it stands for like out it, like it, I don't know. That's why it's called an owl. Someone, someone gave it to me as a present. I haven't made a backstory for the owl. Sorry. Um. There's something below you, even farther down, but you can't read it with your owl from here. There are no other life forms, at least not alive ones, except for you on this floor. Except the building itself reads as a technological life form. You coin a word for that on the fly. Nanobots. Sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, I've right. heard some stories about Grey Goo. It's the ontological wisdom liaison, okay? Uh, it. But what it does give you is this. The numbers don't mean anything to you, of course. Uh... The room that has the most reading of Paradox Resonance is 12. It's also a decent amount coming from 3. The rest seem relatively unimportant, like computer rooms, living quarters, that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, most importantly, does it detect any other awakened individuals that not on this up? floor? But there is something right. underneath of you it can't read. Well, we, either we gotta find another way down, but I think we might be safe here, aside from the fact that the walls are moving. Well, as long as they're not closing in. Not yet. If yeah, they are, I could probably stop them. Kieran makes a very ironic cross shape at the uh, oh area. One of its features, what it get is that it gets to tell you the consensus. So like we're like, full in tech is right, right? Tech holds all the answers here. Yeah. So like, even even most of your most of the stuff you can get away with on the street won't be possible in here unless you somehow make it techy earn that quintessence to lower difficulties they will all be two yeah. points higher for all of you one point higher for gray by default some things won't work at all so 12 or 3 the rest of the rooms even if you wander you won't find anything interesting Twelve seems a cromulent number. Hey. Okay. Wait. What number? Twelve. No. Oh, he's those... a cromulent. 
they the, could probably what is I'm sorry what does that mean it's sorry it's a it's a made-up word it doesn't mean anything it, oh. it just it, it means appropriate or it's like frack I mean technically they're all made up words yes everything's made up stay woke um but uh yeah I just I just meant 12 seems fine it's a nice number has a lot of things that divide into it. Got you two, got you three, got you four, you six. In fact, it is the number that has the most things that divide into it up until you hit 60 and then 60 beats it. There we go. And 60 holds the title for a very long time, just so you know. Like well into the hundreds before 60 is defeated. Well, so, without objection, then 12. Well, I just want to make this clear 12 has very few exit routes, where three has a stairs and a hallway to get away from. If we walk into 12, we have very few places to run. And three is picking up a high energy level as well. And so, if we're not, if, if 12 and threes are just the numbers of the rooms and not the entities that are within it. Looking for an escape. I look for an escape route. I figure we're going to end up in both. <laughs> it doesn't matter which one we take first. Well, then let's do it. We could leave it to chance. I know that would uh, please our friend here. Points over to Kieran. Flip a coin. Heads, it's 12. It's 12. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if you're fired, I could actually roll it, but you know, nah, it's 12. Let's go to 12. 12 is a lab. Oh, yeah, Two examination See, this is... tables. I knew it was 12. Two examination tables are here, but only one is occupied. It's a body bag, it's all zipped up. Oh, I hate this kind of lab. Uh, X rays line the walls, too. And there's a book, dog eared, on a counter. What do you do? Look closer. I mean, that's our job. Uh, so I will try to, like, science investigation this place up a bit. What are you going to look closer at? The body bag, the x rays, or the book? Uh, if there's any document documentation attached to anything, I'm going to look at that first before opening a body bag. Just saying. Book is Milton's Paradise Lost. Hmm. Oh no. <laughs> That's sus. Uh also a is... door in here unmarked to another room. Uh using mind and or spirit and prime. What's in the bag? Dead body. You okay. open it. I will let someone else do that. Be a vampire, it's true. Does anyone uh, open the body bag? If no one else does, the professor eventually finds a pair of gloves somewhere in this lab and puts oh, yeah. them on before opening the bag. A horribly deformed human being. She looks like her flesh flowed for a few seconds and then stopped. Like turned into water and oh. then didn't. She's been refrigerated. Interesting. Uh, you recognize this as one of the 13 victims from your records you got from Nine Men. The name's Amelia. Was. You look at the x-rays, and each one of them displays some sort of strange disfigurement. Like this, but weirder. I'm curious this if maybe a uh, combination forces one time one might be able to elucidate how flesh turned into liquid you gonna try uh, I'm I'm asked I'm asking for permission to try 
Uh, roll perception plus awareness. Oh, perception and awareness. Very well. Um, as long as you have both of those spheres, you're good to go. Ah, okay. So that'll be a roll. Four ten. Ooh, eight and eight and eight and eight. Uh, the body is suffused with the gross resonance you got from all of those forms. This Richter person. This old Nazi. Uh, and so is the room that's on the other side of that door, only it's worse there. Uh, meaning that he did technocratic operations on this patient, science magic, to make this happen. He bonded it with something. He tried to put something in it that wasn't human, and it did not go well. Genetic material that contains something powerful with prime and spirit. Failed super soldier experiment. Guile, you ever seen anything like this before? The spiritual resonance is not any kind of spirit you've ever dealt with. It's something alien. Hmm. What is my not natural to Earth? All right. I haven't. But there's been stories of stuff like this. And I wonder if I could... I don't have anything I can use. Um, is there a way that I could um, use any more of my... that use all my spirit? I think I used all my spirit. Oh, that doesn't run out. That stays at four. Uh... You don't even have to roll to know that this is alien, like... Oh no, we lost Ambrose. Yeah, we lost Ambrose. <laughs> Literally alien. No. Genetic material from an alien life form from another world. Ambrose would be screaming Xenomorph if he was here. To you, it would be repulsive, very unnatural. You would not mix this with a human form. Why would you do that? It's like yeah, I think I've heard some of those stories. Cat. I think I've heard some of those stories you're talking about. Pretty sure David Duchovny's in one of them. <laughs> you see, that's just them trying to convince you that it might be possible in case this ever wakes up. And I, I poke it because someone wanted me to poke it in chat. <laughs> cold to the touch because it was refrigerated but nothing weird happens nothing explodes out of it uh but working with lung guile you have life gray um nope i have life so jealousy and lung guile working together can understand even though you don't know much about science necessarily that they were taking the genetic material and using it and turning it into a form that could try to bond with human DNA. We call those viruses. Well, if that's the case, this could get out. But poking the body does reveal something interesting when you turn it over. And Aki markings are carved into it. Oh. The technocracy was merging the traditional magic with their own science to make this happen. Oh, and that would be something I would recognize. Yes. This stuff here, this is the figurative language of angels and demons. We're not talking alien viruses. Or at least not alien viruses alone. We're talking... We're talking diabolical stuff. 
could also be wildly deviant. This is the antithesis of technocracy. Mixing their, yeah. their science with your magic. They don't do I that. bet you they weren't telling their superiors about this experiment. Go into the next room. Before before we we do, I I keep one of those disposable film cameras on me. Click, 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 click. Done. So, uh, one of the things on my sheet is Gift of Tongues. Uh, yep. I haven't been able to find what it does, but can I use it to decipher the Enochian? Yes, you can. Oh, we even have common cause there. <laughs> Uh, uh, partial summoning ritual for a major umbrood. Mm. Oh, that's not good. Like, psychopomp level. For Moxie and Lungile. Uh, it's like summoning a demigod. Can I break it? Didn't work. It's already uh, failed. It failed. Yeah. Apparently, it failed yeah. 13 times out of 14. Aw, oh, shit. The, um. Whatever would result from this, they're obviously attempting to fuse an alien, for lack of a better term, but probably what they would consider a deep space being into human form. I would imagine an effort to control it. It is likely a puppet. Probably broke free. I'll bite. I very very slowly very <laughs> very quietly very very carefully with the skill of somebody who's probably freed a few animals from labs before open that door nothing tears out at you what it is is a summoning room got medical equipment and a refrigerator filled with exactly pre-measured doses of morphine. Just enough, you know, to deal with, I don't know, paradox backlash? Uh, with a dark gray padded footlocker on the floor in the middle of a summoning circle. The hermetic summoning circle. Uh, there is a decidedly untechnocratic collection of artifacts in it. And then placed over the rest of the contents is the sheathed broadsword with a single engraved swastika. Uh, it's a summoning sword. You would know that, uh, Jonah and Jealousy. Five seals sculpted in gold, iron, silver, and bronze are in the locker, representing Angel, Outsider, Shadow, and Dominion. And then you don't know what the last one is. And at the bottom, a large, battered black folder stamped with an eagle and a swastika. Uh, what's in the folder? I start paging through that. Something called the Black Papers. And markings from the uh, trials as if this was what the point of the secret trial was that disappeared. Uh, it describes the experiments at Dachau and the Torture Fountain in its final phase, the merging of human and alien. And then Richter's notes saying, if we could make this work, the resultant being could control the Avatar Storm. It would be so, something he calls an Anakim, or Anunnaki, or uh -uh. Nephilim. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I've heard of those before. That's why the world drowned that one time. Yay, we have Ambrose back. Yes, Joan, you would recognize that as essentially trying to merge an awakened mage with an earthbound or its equivalent of brood. Oh, and that's bad. Or 
Earthbounder. I have, uh, so didn't get tossed into the. Pit. I have slinged so many books full of Anunnaki conspiracy theories, only to be <laughs> led right here. Uh, TLDR for uh, Ambrose's character. You, you figured out that they're trying to merge a demigod devil spirit with an awakened mage to create a being that can control the Avatar Storm. Oh, yeah, yeah. That sounds Enough like a Friday night for me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm going to uh, grab um, like a, a vinyl looking uh, bag and try to place that sword inside of it. Uh, but the bag is something that I use to, like, collect artifacts to destroy them uh, when we find them, or whatever, you know, like, uh, just so you don't need to touch it. Some of these things are cursed, you know. <laughs> yeah. That shit's real. I don't care what anyone says about science, like, like, curses are real. I've seen it with my own eyes. Well, there is something else in this room. Well, an elevator shaft. The elevator's collapsed and is laying at the bottom in a heap. Uh, while everybody's looking at the elevator shaft, uh, Lundgyle walks over with his uh, Indiana Jones satchel and uh, puts the morphine in the bag for later use. <laughs> I always take the morphine. You have the morphine surrettes. Do the rest of you look down into the elevator shaft? I certainly do. Uh, yes. Pretty hard Cold not wind to blows stare up. down an elevator shaft when, when Cold wind blows up at you. The wind that screams. Like a thousand souls tortured and dying in the explosion of Alderaan. Sounds like the Avatar Storm. Your senses tell you that matter and spirit have collided here, and it is one giant shallowing. That's where the first levels of the worlds beyond Earth meet Earth, if they tear open a hole in reality. Something of immense power has merged the nearby spirit worlds with Earth down there. And the Avatar, and the Avatar started started out. Yeah, it just exists in reality below us. All right. Uh... This is a little above my pay grade, y'all. <laughs> uh, can Lungao use any of his? Well, your life. You're the only one who could safely go down there. You yeah, can also you try the... to take them with you. You have the merit that, like, kind of lets you sidestep the storm. Which also means you could walk through that level and theoretically take them with you. The catch is, doing so means that's all you can do while you're down there, is concentrate fully on preventing the storm from tearing them apart, literally. Shredding their spirits and bodies. But you could do it. Maybe that's why they sent you. What do you guys think? Do it. Just to be clear, we're gonna we're gonna kill this thing if we see it, right? Absolutely, it's an abomination. All right, we're gonna we're gonna shred its spirit if it has one. We're gonna like blast it out of every realm we know of. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. And, you know, like I do know that uh, hopefully uh, now we know that. Uh, Typically, the, the black guy doesn't die first in this. So to make sure as long as I decide I, to go down the shaft to, uh, leaving all of this. So I, I, I assure you, I assure you, if you go down, the concept of going first won't mean a whole lot. The rest of us will be right behind you. That is true. Absolutely right behind you. You ever seen a cheese grater for the soul? Because that's what we're talking about. Yes. Oh my you're, god. You're the only thing to, keeping that from happening to them. What? We need to publish that as an anti-chicken soup for the soul. Cheese grater for the soul. <laughs> Pick it up at the Strange Trails bookstore. 
I, I would contribute to that zine. Before you have a new picture we... in the Zoom? Nope, yeah. go ahead. Before we go on any other course of action, you, you said there was a large collection of objects that are clearly uh, not technocratic. Uh, yeah, the symbols made of iron, brass, gold, and silver that represent those different words in Anakian. Uh, uh, angel, outsider, shadow, dominion, and alien. Those would those would be of interest for me. Well, I, Take those. I threw them in a bag. I, I would hand you the bag oh, gladly. Okay. okay, I thought you just if, took the sword. If you were looking Man. at them, I would say, like, I've tried to put anything that looked artifacty in the bag. Once, the once we start Nazi talking about sword. crossing it, once we start talking about crossing the Avatar Storm and Anokia, it might be gone, useful. Gutter, like, gutter Magic Kid is going to think about that one, you know? So. We might oh, need so it to undo Anarchian. the enchantment, you know? You, ne you never know with these things. <laughs> Yeah, never know. It's also the evil, grab it all. the evil Nazi sword, which I keep pointing out, because even if you don't use it, you don't want to leave it laying around. Absolutely yeah. not. Maybe you can melt it. I don't know. Break it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to plan to smelt that down and turn it into a symbol for freedom. I don't know. Only after I defile it repeatedly first. Just don't lollygag. Thanks for the raid, lollygaggers. Beat you, Ambrose. So, I uh, yeah. internet delay. Yeah, that was that was totally. <laughs> Why? Jealousy. You have the Anakian symbols in gray. You have the vile sword. Sure. Okay. Just to be clear, I haven't touched it. Yeah. No. It, you've only touched the sheath, which is mundane. You pass down the shaft with ropes surrounded by Lungile's protective spirit effect that takes all of his concentration to maintain for six of you. Uh, it's an underground chamber with a massive isolation lab in the middle. Uh, everything is smashed and distorted here around the entire chamber. There's manacles melted and tossed everywhere, chains wrapped into each other, part of fused with the stone walls now. Uh, holding cells that are just slag metal and bars now. Vials of strange caustic fluid, smashed computer equipment, x-rays fluttering in the screaming specter wind. Only the isolation slab itself retains its original shape. It's dark concrete sitting in the middle. You can hear hoarse screams echoing through the concrete walls. The walls writhe with the nanobot material, but they're reacting to the resonance cascading through here and doing what they're designed to do morph for the pleasure of the inhabitants the floor is covered in the stuff and uh pseudopods strange symbols and human phases just appear out of the stuff like t2s from terminator the ceiling is a shimmering mist through which you can see umbral constellations a giant red star burning with malevolent light <laughs> bands of power trying to pierce through it into earth you can sense it with your magic whatever that is whatever that realm is is bad the resonance is so powerful the technocratic paradigm is gone in this area all magic is coincidental there is no paradox for anything you do oh uh the the owl chirps and says uh uh i can't think like like, turn it up to 11 or something like that when, when, as soon as we walk into that room. And then eight soldiers walk up to you, dressed in a typical technocratic battle uniform, not cyborgs, but technocrats in body armor, except for one minor detail. Their bodies have luminous eyes, bloody wings, and other aspects of fallen angels coming out of them, and they all just walk up and look at you and fan out in a group. They do not raise their weapons. They do not speak. Clearly possessed. Uh, is it possible with Prime or Spirit or Mind to see what is possessing them? Uh, yeah. Go ahead and roll your arte. Difficulty 5. Okay. Could I spend a quintessence to bring that down by one? Yes. I will do that. Because I got, still have an embarrassing amount of quintessence. Uh, 
three successes. They're possessed by avatar shards because the avatar storm is shredded avatars. Are they friend avatars or foe avatars? They're mindless zombie avatars that really just are curious. Hi. Many eyes blink at you. Way too many. Are you here to help or are you here to hurt? I don't seem to be reacting to normal speech. Maybe it's a resonance or frequency you can't hit. Shall we carry on then? I'm gonna then? go over this way. I start <laughs> telegraphing with my a, move. With an intelligence and a cult role, perhaps I could ask them some basic questions in Enochian. Roll at a cult with intelligence. See what you get. Difficulty six, standard. Uh, that's gonna be six. Um, uh, three successes in aggregate. You need to use prime and the right tonal pitch to speak to them. In other words, Joan and Moxie can work in concert to make that happen. <laughs> in concert. <laughs> 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 I have my tuning fork out. And my pipes are ready. So, oh, Arate plus Prime, or just Arate for Prime, and then Moxie could roll uh, Expression plus Charisma. Difficulty six for Moxie, five for Joan. I'm spending another point of point to bring that down. Just to be clear, while they're doing that, I'm reaching into the bag looking for the one labeled explosive. I mean, your owl's explosive. Well, yeah, yeah, but it's probably not the only explosive chemicals I carry in my bag. No, it's not. So I'm gonna use quintessence to bring my down. Okay. Uh, in fact, I probably have some C4. Me. Probably have some C4 or something equivalent as well. Not that I would know how to use it effectively, but. Got it. What did Mark get? Did I roll four? What was that? Sorry. That's okay. Uh, four. Successes. Four successes. Yeah. You are able to communicate with them. What do you say? Happened to you. The storm. We are now greater than the sum of our whole. So you became it. It became us. We now serve him. Who is he? They all point in unison to the containment chamber. The one who survived. He wishes to speak with you. What does he want to tell us? Of his glorious mission. To bring all of the exiles home. Who are the exiles? all those who were banished from this world long ago. Banished they were friend. banished for a reason, and it was a good reason. The one who... The one who allowed him to enter is also in there. But he works counter-purpose to the one, so... He is contained. I would just... All right, 
tell me if this is a bad idea. If there's a way that I can like make this roll to understand if it's a bad idea. I would just like to start pushing Prime into this containment thing with the intention of like essentially overloading it. Like when you uh, fry a computer because you just sink too much electricity into it. Uh, you can certainly try. Oh god. Uh, I use that phrase when I run games and I know what that <laughs> means. When, uh, when, when you go to raise your hands, I'm like, be careful, remember the person in control is, was one of us. There's an awakened individual behind this somewhere feeding yes, it a bunch there. of energy might give it something to control the one you refer to as awakened is also in there he is counter purpose to the one so he is contained he has served his purpose how exactly is he contained they just point again like go in there find out okay cheers Gray's going into the containment chamber what about the rest of you uh I essentially want to provide covering fire okay like I am standing near the chamber but not inside of it ready to just unleash whatever power seems to be required. Okay. I give everyone some luck really quick. Uh, sure. How do... Heretic. Oh, well, I wasn't sure if um, something else was needed. I must spend a willpower. Five uh, difficulty start. of. Hmm? Five to start. Five willpower or difficulty? <laughs> difficulty. Okay. Five successes. No, I lied. Four successes. Okay. Oh, no, wait. Willpower will... is plus one Index success. success. Yeah. Okay, so five successes. It is five. Okay. I will tell you what that means when it matters. Well, now I'm scared. Are you going in with them? Uh, I go in. Debating on where my character would be more useful. Staving off those uh, possessed beings or in the containment chamber. It's up to you to figure out. A particular set of skills. That's the thing about being you. Wherever you are is exactly where you needed to be. Valid. Uh. Hmm. I I, I do want to point out that Lungile is literally in concentration, trying to protect everybody. So. Is this is that outside, still the case? Yeah. Is that still yeah. the case in here? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Even more probably. Yeah. I'm like uh, I'm safe to walk in there. Buddy, friend, not pal. gonna get eaten alive, am I? I'm like looking for. Okay, I don't want explosive. I'm going into a small room. Uh, caustic, yeah, caustic will do. Yeah. Uh, with that information, Joan is dividing her attention between Gray and Long Isle. Just like, if either one of you needs covering fire, I am ready to unleash a whole bunch of prime. I'm I'm going into back and mom. I'm, if you, in case you can't tell, Professor Gray is not the most eloquent. <laughs> a communicator might be a good person. <laughs> I think I'm gonna go in too, just in case I need to stop time for a second, and also for my social skills. Okay. Um. Shoot. 
It's okay, Protector Link. Good point. Guard the thing keeping all of us safe. Oh, well, the person, not the thing, sorry. The thing is the magic. I'm used to it being the a device. The magic bearer. I'm used to it being a device, I'm sorry. Sorry. Those of you who go inside, it's a lab with a fridge, a bunch of medical instruments lining the walls, a single very large examination table, cutting edge, uh, and a thing standing in the room that's seven feet tall with smooth gray skin broken by scarring and scabs. The eyes are just huge black pools set into an elongated skull, and the hands have six fingers twice as long as humans with bloody black tendrils twitching and fluttering from each uh, shoulder. Kind of like wings, but not. And a blonde German fellow strapped to the table, screaming. Blood pooled beneath the table. I'm the sure you deserve that, sir. is just caressing its head with talons. I'm sure you deserve that, sir. It doesn't look up, its mouth doesn't move, you're not even sure it has a mouth, but it says, ah, yes, you're finally here. Never late, never early, always on time. I'm glad you've joined me. One who summoned us? Yes. Why? My brothers and sisters need hosts. So this is a trap. No, it's an offer. It's a bargain. What are you trading? Uh. That's a good question. What's the trading? No, what's your offer? What's the offer? We want the same thing you do. Is that so? What yes. do we want? To remove these, applies pressure to head of Nazi technocrat from the world. Make it what it once was. A place where our kind can thrive. You can help form that new world. It's amazing, I could get a 9mm and do the same thing. Your guns are not effective enough to stop them, or they would have already. They're the ones who decide how the guns work. So you want us to help you create a mutant race of mages who are not really sentient. No, not a race. I want I want you to help us reset the world to what it once was. But they won't be us. There'll be some other version of something that isn't one or the other. Once we return to the world to its former state, we will leave you. The entire time they're having this conversation, my hands are like in my bag, messing around with a couple of vials and like, um, can I start cooking up a big bang if it's needed in about three turns? Yes. Uh, forces three, prime two, standard. Uh, focused explosion. Yeah, it'll be a five. Then you can just pre-roll, and then if the time comes, you can tell me what your yep. total was. I'll just make a roll every couple minutes that we're talking here. Whoa. That sounded very loud through someone's microphone. Sorry. Anyway, sorry. Continue the those of you in the room. Looks expectantly at you. Uh, 
I got a better idea. Counter offer, if you like. Just a little something to consider. Our offer is, you piss the fuck right off. We put the world the way it ought to be. Seems like you've been failing at that for a long time. Yeah, we got examples of it right in front of us, pal. It looks towards the other two of you. Oh no. No, 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 we're doing the talking right now. I bargain with a lot of demons in my life. And I don't really put up with them very well. I start very quietly pacing the floor, starting to etch out the first of a line, a triangle of binding for a summoning circle. Curious what Boxy's reaction is. Hmm. I'm not sure what my reaction should be, quite frankly. I do, I have one occult. Um, and three. Basically saying, let us possess you so we can burn the whole world down, and when the new world order arises, you can have your body back. Right. No. Uh, no. Absolutely not. That's not what I want at all. It says... That's unfortunate. We will simply have to take what we need. Now it's time to hit that initiative button. Uh, what is going on for those of us outside? When on the inside that line is delivered, the, the things outside immediately turn hostile. <laughs> it's obvious oh. something went wrong. Okay. One guy yells at Professor Gray. You better have that. You better have that stuff ready to blow. I love how when we roll an initiative, it still counts the successes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but uh, I rolled a twelve. Also twelve. And um, mine come through. Um, we got yes. two rolls, actually. Yeah, how that happened. That's All okay. Right. okay we'll Your first, first one's one. better. Yeah. yeah, 14. So then I only need... 16. One guy else, looks like. The outside mm -hmm. guy here. Just run a uh, roll initiative? Yep, just hit that button that says initiative. There we go. So, between Karen and uh, Joan, who has the better dexterity. We got uh, four. My... I have two. Okay. About wits, how do you compare there? Three. Uh, four. Okay. Kieran will go first. There's the initiative order. Normally we would do a whole weird thing, but we're not going to do that tonight. We're just going to take our actions. So, Professor Gray is first. Um, if, uh, am I what, am I in a position I would consider a back line? Like, is there someone between me and the obvious threat? Uh, no. All right, then. Because of the way the, the building, you're, you're fanned out. Yeah, uh, then I probably just finish this, uh, long cast that I've been doing. Uh, by taking the uh, the vial that I had been cooking up and just tossing it at its feet, uh, and it it'll it'll go boom. Okay. Um, uh, difficulty five, you said. I'm gonna bring it down to three with two quintessence and spend a willpower at the flash. Okay. So that's a total of eleven successes on a forces three prime two directed explosion, like directly at the feet of this one. Joan, what are you going to do? I call on Joan. Going in the order of Zoom. Rhett, what are you going to do? What is Jealousy going to do? Ooh. 
That's a great question. Um, a, mo a moment just for some situational awareness. You'd said that there was somebody working against this thing, but it's in a containment field. Well, that's Rector the Nazi who summoned it. Ah, okay. This is a successful experiment that's done with the Nazi. Got it. Okay. Um... I am, shoot, not entirely sure what I am going to do with this. I know what I'm going to do. All right. Okay. Um, so uh, having finished drawing out like a, a binding triangle with like the, the dust in my foot, um, I'm actually going to, um, launch the forces effect to restrain the uh the creature okay we're just gonna go with difficulties of five for magic for this encounter Alrighty. um i actually want as many successes as i could get four three it is now difficulty two and go. Submit it, submit it. I forgot to lower the difficulty, but it, it was difficulty two, so it's actually three successes. Uh, actually, three is the floor you can go, but still, that's five successes. Three, five, seven, eight, eight. <laughs> okay. Okay. What is a boxy gonna do? Oxy is going to time um, to freeze um, just the demonic Nazi, and everyone else is active. Okay, roll the irritate. Difficulty five. You can spend two contestants to bring it to three. I'm gonna do that. I had one success inside. Uh, that would normally have been the case, but that's actually five. Yeah. Okay. What is Kieran going to do? Ooh, so I was debating. I think um, I might give... I don't know if I can do all of the enemies, but definitely the ones that uh, Joan and I are facing to protect Long Isle. You're going to deal with the eight soldiers? Yeah. That's good. Somebody needs to. <laughs> what are you going to do to them? God, there's eight of them. Uh, so, Prime is... What... What would affect an avatar more, prime or spirit or something else entirely? An avatar shard. Destroy the body. The shard means nothing. It returns to the storm. Oh. Okay. So life. I would like to combine life and entropy and begin decaying them. Difficulty five. Roll it. You can use two contestants to bring it to a three. Because remember, all magic is coincidental here, so as weird as you want. So, I'm going to burn those two quintessence and a willpower. Okay. So, can I, with my prime, support uh, what Kieran's doing? Because I'm right after him on the initiative tracker. Um, the thing is, is, like, as good as I am with World of Darkness, I've never really been able to grasp what prime can do. Prime can directly uh, attack a pattern with aggravated damage regardless of the pattern's source. At Prime 4, any pattern. 
Oh, let's do that. Prime four, it's like it's the effect is basically radiant beam, right? Yeah. Like it, it, true damage is basically prime, right? One of the few instances where a prime mage can shine is killing a super ghost or a super demon. Yeah. So uh, a one, two sevens, a nine, and a ten. It ten says kills three the one, so that's one, two, three, four, five successes. Awesome. Can this look totally like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones, where they just yes. like melt? Yes. Excellent. Great. Thank you. And then uh, get the roll from Joan. Uh, yeah. So I'm spending uh, three more quintessence. That'd be an RK roll? Yep. Minimum difficulty is three. Excellent. Oh, five successes. And so, then, uh. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, if it's over. radiant damage, then I just imagine, like, energy waves coming from Joan. Um. With, you know, some dove feathers mixed in there. Question. Yes. Are the dove feathers like darts where the the quill aims at them, or do they just kind of like float through? They just like float through like dust motes, because um, a dove is in art history is like a symbol for the Holy Spirit. I I I, I can dream. I'm not. This character is not violent. So here's what happens. You pour all that endless raw magic from four dot spheres into that room with radiant energy. And with uh, explosive power and with uh, different form of energy jealousy. <laughs> uh, jealousy did the forces uh, push. Push, the literally, as well. literally like, place wrapping it up yeah, in a cage. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And that whole containment chamber explodes, but it finishes tearing the hole into the other side, wherever that red star is coming from. It just opens access to reality from there. In the other part of the room, Moxie holds the bad guys in place while Karen just melts them. The skin just slags off their body and then it just collapses into steaming heaps. Pretty gross. I yell, hey, Lungile! Makes Kieran smile a little bit. I know you're pretty busy making sure we all don't die, but we're all gonna die if you don't come look at this thing and tell us how to stop it. <laughs> you destroy the physical form of the entity. Also, the Nazi dies, but no one cares because it's a Nazi. It's a fucking. Uh, oh, I made sure he was in the explosive blast yes. when I threw the. <laughs> There's nothing left of him. You shredded his soul with that prime effect. Uh. But whatever was inside of the entity escapes through that reality and somewhere else on Earth. Wait, you Never. said Red Star. Yeah. Oh shit. <laughs> Guys, we fucked up. Uh, the soul of the being escapes through the Terran reality and into some other part of the world. Possibly a quiet, lonely island in Lake, uh, in, uh, Lake Huron. That's a story for another time. Uh, the problem is, now there's a hole in reality ripped open, and you're all being sucked into wherever that red star is. It's probably a good time for Moxie and Lungile to stop that from happening. Moxie can freeze this moment, and Lungile can do his thing to prevent you from being pulled across the gauntlet, and then somebody's going to have to teleport you out of here. So who's got the highest correspondence? Mine's only two. We ain't, we ain't stepping through any gateways with me. I have three. Mine's only two. Are, are we going to pop back out of the puffin enclosure? You're not those poor puffins. Uh, what's Kieran's correspondence in Jones? <laughs> okay. That means it's jealousy. So I need Arate from Jealousy, Lungile, and Moxie. The difficulty is seven, but you can bring that down with Quintessence. The max you can spend is three, meaning you would bring it down to four. Also, I'm going to need Ambrose to roll six to ten because of your Paradox Backlash. God damn. 
<laughs> I am also spending a willpower. And... Let's do that, do that, and difficulty. I brought it down to four. Four successes, and the willpower is five. Brilliant. Critical success. Um, I want to use three contest, uh, contestants. So okay. Can we make difficulty four, same for Moxie. Yeah. All right. I'm going to spend a willpower, too. Are you spending willpower, Lungile? Yes. That's three for Lungile, and now let's see what Moxie gets. Five. Okay. Uh, and what about... Kieran, with that paradox backlash. <laughs> uh, so that was um nine eight three two six six. Your paradox is now down to two, so there's that. Uh, Moxie is able to hold back time for the brief moment it takes Lungile to figure out the nearest way to step across and not get shredded by the Avatar Storm. The Kieran's hand slips away from Longile as you're moving through the uh, barrier between worlds. For a brief moment, Kieran is alone in the Avatar Storm. You take four activated damage. But that's yeah. when the Brophy tide around him comes in handy. Yeah. <laughs> that's what prevents him from being spun away forever. It does shred part of your soul and your spirit and a large chunk of your body. Oh no, I'm more of a sociopath. Whatever will I do? I... If you were a long-term character, it's actually real bad. You'd lose Arate. <laughs> I am taking you to a retreat, young man. <laughs> a very nice monastery in the mountains. <laughs> if we can find a way back to the Talarian. So they have a bar. Um... They brew their own ale. A deal. 3% ABV. You step through into the woods of Lungile, the woods of Indiana where Lungile would be at home. You step through the wild for a brief moment, a primordial place with lots of wolf owls. And then you step across into the deep woods of Indiana when the portal snaps shut behind you. You all take Paradox, it's okay, it's a one shot, you don't have to worry about it, for the real world not liking what you just did. And probably collapse in exhaustion, but you're alive. It's nighttime where you land. You all fall onto your backs and look up into the sky. The sky that has a strange new red star. Is it July? It is July. And that's where we paused this one shot. He killed a Nazi and stopped fallen angels from taking over the world. So good job. Great success has been achieved. We didn't just stop the Nazi. We melted him. Yeah. He like shredded his soul too. Was that his prime attack? <laughs> okay. Uh... This tale may have drawn to a close, but there's 12 more tales to tell in our Love Your Rebellion 2022 charity event. Tomorrow, Rachel's running Under the Reckoning, and we'll have some special guests there, I think. I can't remember which ones have special guests. <laughs> uh, where's our schedule, Ambro? Oh, uh, that uh, should be in the lounge. Uh so my cast for tomorrow is Mom Size, Yep, She's Blasian, Michelle Carraway, Vipples, yep. Salubri Cat, and House Tremere. Michelle is the special guest from Love Your Rebellion, assuming uh, she's able to make it tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday is going to be uh, Changeling the Dreaming, which Ambrose is running, and Danielle will be there on Love Your Rebellion. On Thursday, uh, Rosie is running Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition. Something about catching ghouled cats possibly go wrong yeah uh, and i'll be in that one as well yes 
and then uh, Friday I'll be running Wraith the Oblivion in the Great War, World War One, during the fourth Great Maelstrom. On Saturday, we'll uh, Zach will be running Vampire the Masquerade as well. Uh, and then on Sunday, I will be running Demon the Fallen. Daniel will be joining us for that one. On Monday, we'll be uh, Night Witches, World War II uh, Russian fighter and bomber pilots. And Angela will return for that to join us. The Tuesday after that will be uh, Brindlewood Bay, where uh, Jason gets to show up with his pearls and his old lady wig and help solve uh, Angela Lansbury-style supernatural crimes. On Wednesday will be uh, Bluebeard's Bride. Danielle's going to show up for some real dark horror there. And Thursday of that week will be me running Monster of the Week. That Friday will be Zach running the Abyss, and finally we will end with Cult Divinity the Lost, run again by Ambrose, bringing our charity or drive to a close. We will also have Danielle in that one. And we may have one or two more special guest stars. We'll see how it goes. So come check them all out. Help us reach milestones. We've already off to a good start. We have raised $240 in the first night, which is pretty awesome. Uh, mages. Let everyone know who you are and where you can be found doing cool things. Hey, everybody. I have enjoyed playing Kieran for you. I have enjoyed suffering from paradox. It's all for a good cause. Um, you can find me all over the internet as Am Changeling. You can find me on Etsy at Thornkind. And you can find me here on Vorpal Tales so much of the time. Much of the time, yes. And hey, I am Narf on the interwebs. My real name's Corey, but I actually just go by Narf for most of my friends anyway. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can find me. I play in an every other Wednesday game on the Onyx Path channel with uh, doing some scarred lands over there. It's a super fun game. Uh, check it out. And uh, also I work on a video game called Caves of Cud. Uh, it's uh, like, retro and futuristic sci-fi poke post-apocalyptic mutations story driven it's got all the fun things in it uh it's just really hard to learn how to play uh but we're working on that actually uh, i do not play video games and that was pretty easy for me to pick up birdie helped me and <laughs> and i'm really bad at video games like I'm really I'll bad help you learn it anytime. DM me in Discord if you if you want to learn how to play Kicks to Cut. Yes. So just saying, Narf is is really underselling this game. It's a cool game. And uh, I'm Rhett. I was playing Jealousy tonight and had a great time doing it. Uh, nothing like. Uh, digging back into my like undergrad years when there were three nights at the goth club every week um i'm gonna miss those days now uh i'm on twitter at road river rail um as i mentioned i'll be coming back to help with one of the one shots on thursday evening so please come check me out as i uh do vampire the masquerade in public for the first time and um if you want to see some really bad jokes about the world of darkness, follow me at Tech Union Actual. Um, and if you'd like me to appear on your live stream, I'm looking for new opportunities. And I'm Angela. I'm the one of the guests for tonight, uh, the founder and chair of the board of directors for Love Your Rebellion. Um, I played Moxie, which was super fun. Um, great character for me. Um, you can find me or Love Your Rebellion at Love Your Rebellion on Instagram and Facebook and on Twitter at um, Love YR Rebellion. If you want to follow me personally, you can do that on Instagram at Moxie Mixtape. And you can follow my thrush punk band um, on Instagram as well at except you e x c e p t like everyone except you. Um, and that's it for me. I'll be back next Monday for Night Witches. Yeah, uh, Jason Teeters here. I played Lungile. I'm a board member of uh, Love for Rebellion. This is my first time playing, and I enjoyed myself. I uh, had a great time. 
You can find me uh, Twitter, Teachers Jason, or Instagram, Teachers Jason. Excited to be a part of this and looking forward to my next uh, game. Hello, uh, my name is Rachel. This was a lot of fun. Uh, I am Stolen Fires pretty much everywhere on the internet. Uh, if you liked this round of Nazi punching, uh, come back next week when I run Night Witches. Uh, it is a very fun Powered by the Apocalypse game about uh, Soviet female pilots in World War II. We're going to bomb the fuck out of some Nazis. Uh, I will also be here tomorrow running Hunter the Reckoning. Uh, it is called the Midnight Gala. We are dropping uh, the hunters in a hospital fundraiser and telling them figure out which one's the vampire. So it might take an hour, it might take four. Who knows? Let's find out. Uh, yeah, and then I will also be in Changeling on Wednesday playing a very creepy sloth and uh, also on Demon because I really like that game. Looking forward to it. Uh, follow me on Twitter, Twitch, and Instagram as Stolen Fires. And I am Tyler Elder Jekyll, also online, and I can be found next running right the Oblivion on Friday and then Demon on Sunday. And then if you want to see where this story came from and where it's going, I connect all of my World of Darkness tales, and this is a direct connection to our Hunter the Recording game and our Mage the Ascension long term game. Players just don't know that yet. Once again, we'd like to give a very special thanks to Dark Somnium Music, Savic, Travis Savoy, Epidemic Sound, Aim to Head Official, Helmgast, Free League, and apparently me for providing all the music you're hearing the next 13 days, plus maybe a little bit of Moxie's band too. Thanks to Roll20 Tabletop for providing an excellent virtual platform we use to run many of our games. And last but not least, a heartfelt thanks to all of you, our ride or die listeners who stayed to the end, and you awesome people who started don our donation train. Let's keep it going. Let's hit some awesome milestones. Uh, until next week, don't don't mess with fallen angels and punch Nazis. Good night.